All right, wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Um, Jay Janindra, uh, and to all the sadhus and sadhvis here, Mate and Vandami, uh, a virtual welcome from Miami and Florida International University, also known as FIU here in the United States. We welcome our respected scholars and students of learning. My name is Dr. Iqbal Akhtar, and I will be your MC and host for the duration of the conference. I'm an associate professor in the departments of religious studies and politics and international relations and the Green School of uh, inter, uh, pub, International and Public Affairs. I'm the director of Jane Studies here at FIU and the founding director of the Western Indian Ocean Studies Program. My research uh, focused on the history of Indian communities in the Western Indian Ocean, such as the Koja community in Tanzania. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you join us today for the second international conference on science and Jain philosophy, an interdisciplinary conference um, that links uh, the science of consciousness and Jain philosophy. This virtual conference has been jointly organized by FIU and the Jain Education and Research Foundation known as JERF. Florida International University is home to the first academic Jain studies program mm -hmm. in the United States and was welcomed to the university by none other than our esteemed Dean Stack. So I will just briefly introduce uh, Dean Stack who will um, open the, the conference for us. So Dean Stack um, holds a joint appointment as professor of politics and international relations uh, in law and is the founding dean of the J, uh, Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs at Florida International University. As professor of politics and uh, international relations law, he serves as instructor of graduate students uh, of the Green School's Department of Politics and International Relations and FIU's mm -hmm. College of Law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he specializes in ethnicity and world politics administrative law, national security, and constitutional law. Dr. Stack graduated from Stonehill College in Easton, Massachusetts with a Bachelor's of Arts with highest honors in 1972. He earned his Master of Arts and PhD um, from the University of Denver and from the University of Miami School of Law in 1989. He has twice served as chair of the Department of Political Science and has been editor of Florida International University uh, uh, University Press. He served as the chair of the board of directors of the Jack Gordon Institute for Public Policy and as chair of the University Research Council. He was instrumental in the founding of FIU's College of Law and chaired the search committees for many administrative positions. He is the author, editor, and co-editor of 16 books and 35 articles and chapters um, and as the founding dean of the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs at Florida International University, he oversees eight departments, 20 centers, and of course, the most important for us is the Jane Studies Program at FIU. So with that, I will welcome Dean Stack uh, to uh, welcome all of the participants from around the world today. Thank you, Iqbal, uh, for that very overly gracious uh, introduction. Uh, I spent 46 years at FIU. I started when I was 26, finished my dissertation here, and then went on. And it has been the experience of a lifetime. And one of the most important programs that I've played a role in is our Jane study. So good morning. Uh, thank you, and to everyone around the planet who is on this conference. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome everybody from around the globe to our conference on Jane philosophy and science. We are indebted to the Jane Educational and Research Foundation for their continued support. For a decade, the Jane community has enhanced the Green School 
and Florida International University in developing our Jane Studies program. Through their endowment in the presence of two Samanis who have played a marvelous role in augmenting Jane Studies often outside the classroom. As I think about it, the human, humanistic values of Jainism in education, social studies, science, religious studies and literature have enhanced the understanding of Jainism for hundreds of students on campus and allowed many students and faculty to travel to India each year. I continually, continually hear from those faculty members about how important Jainism has been to uh, each and how it has expanded their worldview. For both students and faculty, the core principles of Jainism have been incorporated into their work, therefore, and for our students incorporated into their ongoing research, the research being very important. So that as Dean, I want to express my deep gratitude for Jerf's belief in us and for their transformative impact on the lives of students and faculty for whom Jane principles have affected them in both profound and ordinary ways. Jainism for me suggests the power of ideals that touch lives and lead to conceptual breakthroughs. I think my friend Deepak Jain would agree wholeheartedly with me. So I am, I am so very proud to have played a small role in supporting the success of JERF and its impact on the lives of our students and faculty through the Jane Studies Program at Florida International University. Welcome everybody to the Green School and to the conference. I look forward to the next few days of wonderful speakers and scholars, and most of all, enlightenment. Enjoy, and I'm grateful to all of you. Thank you so much, Dean Stack. It's wonderful to, to hear the, those words and thank you for welcoming the community uh, to FIU. Um, so I will uh, continue now um, to just give you a sense of why we're all here today, um, kind of the impetus behind it, and to give you sort of an outline of how the next four days of the conference should go. So the conference then for all of us envisions an interdisciplinary dialogue between cutting edge science and the scientific study of consciousness uh, in, scholars, uh, in dialogue with scholars of Jainism. There's a great diversity of speakers that are represented here from university chairs to renunciants. And the reason for this is that we wanted to democratize the higher education academic space and to value diverse types of knowledge and knowing as well as to facilitate interesting conversations and encourage improbable meetings to stimulate new ideas. We're connected live via Zoom and Facebook Live with panelists across 13 time zones and with more than a thousand registered participants with thousands joining us from around the world on Zoom and Facebook Live. Recordings of all of the sessions will be posted on the Jane Studies website at the conclusion of the conference. On behalf of Florida International University and the Jane Education and Research Foundation, we welcome you to the second International Conference on Science and Jane Philosophy. So before we begin, a, free, a few notes of protocol uh, and a note of concern. So I know that um, one of the major conference organizers, Professor Pratap Sancheti, is in ill health and we wish him a speedy recovery. He was instrumental in organizing this conference over the past year, and we look forward to seeing him again soon and hopefully before the end of the conference. Now, a few notes about conference protocol. Uh, as MC, I will introduce the panel moderator, who will in turn introduce the panelists. Most of the presentations are recorded, um, following which there will be a live question and answer session with the panelists. This Zoom conference is in webinar mode, 
So if you're an attendee attending us, you can ask questions by typing in the question and answer field, the Q&A field at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get uh, to as many of the questions in, uh, as possible before we have to move on to the next section. Uh, a note for panelists, uh, if you're going over your time limit, we will give you a two minute warning uh, by the moderator and then be interrupted so we can move on to the next panelist uh, and stay within schedule. We mean no disrespect to all of the honored scholars that are joining us, but we need to ensure the integrity and the timeliness of the program so that we're able to fairly allocate our time to everyone and everyone gets a chance to speak. Thank you again for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for this intellectual journey into Jainism and the study, scientific study of consciousness. We appreciate your attention and hope that you will learn from our esteemed colleagues and um, as well as learning from you through your comments and questions. Before I begin, I would like to thank our conference organizing committee for their hard work between our monthly meetings and multiple daily emails over the past six months to make this conference a success and a model of academic community cooperation. Sapan Bafna, Dr. Nirmal Baid, Pooja Bantia, Pedro Bota, Samaniji Chaitanya Pragya, Amy Ellis, Dana Fernandez, Dr. Deepak Jain, Dr. Eric Larson, Daniel Liederman, Jeanette Garcia Montes, David Skip, Dr. Pratap Sanchetti, and Dr. Neptune Srimal. Thank you again for your help and support. And we will now begin with the first panel for today. Um, the moderator for the first panel will be uh, Professor Samani Chaitanya Pragya, who is a senior disciple in the Jain Shwetambara Terapanti tradition. She is a visiting professor at Florida International University here in Miami. She was the former head of the JCRP at the Jain Vishwa Bharati Institute in Ladnun um, and is also the founding director of the Bhagwan Mahavir International Research Center um, at JVBI. So I will now turn it on over to Samaniji and she will then um, introduce uh, the next person in the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Iqbal, for introducing about the conference and about the session. Okay, so this is the first invited session, which we are going to start right now. And this particular uh, invited session, there are th three main speakers. Uh, Reverend Acharya Shri Nandighosh Vijayji, uh, respected Professor Kanti Mardia and Professor Chakravarti Dev Kumar. So I would like to introduce first Acharya Vijay Nandighosh Suriswarji. Acharya Vijay Nandighosh Suriji uh, is the chief mentor of a research institute of scientific secrets from Indian Oriental scriptures. He has conducted critical and innovative research in Jainism and science like physics, especially relating to quantum mechanics and astro astrophysics, astronomy and microbiology, as well as astrology, metaphysics, acoustics of music and mantra and yantra. He had published nearly a dozen books related to scientific concepts of Jainism. And he, is do, he has been doing so many scientific research on different Jain practices from many, many years. In the last 2020 is uh, six, uh, 16 uh, ICHJP, he has uh, shown all his experimental studies. So I am very much glad to see Acharyaji in this particular in second international conference too. And I would request to uh, introduce uh, he, himself uh, if he wants to introduce anything and I can start his talk. So I request to Acharya Nandikhush Vijayji for his talk. Every speaker has been given 20 minutes for the talk and 10 minutes for discussion. So please uh, keep uh, your talk uh, within the time so that uh, there can be good interaction with the audience. Is it possible to define consciousness scientifically? 
every philosophical tradition of ancient india discussed about universe and its all contents including soul and consciousness why science didn't accept the existence of soul because science discusses and gives understanding only about physical objects even though the scientist who discusses about universe and its content himself is a living element and therefore as a scientist on the scientific basis or rationalism he denied the existence of soul or consciousness if our body is only the composition of either material elements or chemical elements then scientists would create it artificially in laboratory but till today it was not possible it may be far away to create it in the laboratory science and scientists are not able to give its understanding in terms of physics in research regarding consciousness western scientists also take support from indian philosophies because it cannot be understood in modern terms of physics without the real understanding about the definition of consciousness given in the indian philosophical tradition since last 5000 years in indian philosophical and spiritual traditions understanding about consciousness is discussed minutely roger penrose and atal are seriously thinking about consciousness and they apply the laws of quantum mechanics consciousness doesn't belong to scientific field though at present research regarding consciousness and has been carried out in western countries and also in india because as previously mentioned india is well known as mother of spirituality since last 5 millennium according to suggestion of dr s h pokhana we have discussed about consciousness in symposium arranged by research institute of scientific secrets from indian vedanta scriptures and ld institute of indology jointly after this symposium in india dr surendra singh pokhana dr narendra bandaji dr siddhi sai etc have started to do some specific innovative and credible research on consciousness some articles of this scientist have been published in the book scientific perspectives of jainism by jain vishwavarti dadnu the prominent scientist renan nibe and edward close gave four references in the research paper regarding consciousness from the articles of our indian scientist dr s s pokhana and dr narendra vandari generally from very old times according to hindu tradition since 5000 years and according to jain traditions since time of first tantra sri adinath in india except charak philosophy all spiritual philosophical and religious, religious traditions believe in existence of consciousness roger penrose et al call it quantum consciousness in an article written by s s s homer and deepak chopra there is fifth chapter the quantum soul a scientific hypothesis in a book in jain philosophy the concept of soul and living being is discussed minutely and descriptive manner and with various aspects no other philosophical traditions of world and even scientific research journal or books have such explanation science discusses it only as consciousness which is not really sufficient also consciousness cannot be fully explained through the principles of modern science or quantum physics both and science statistic and relativity a scientist named van der aquino gives a statement in his book they recognize the soul as one type of unknown power and it reacted with physical body through chemical processes and it has been frequently described as the as a body of unknown energy coupled to human body by means of a mutual interaction some neuroscientists prove with alpha beta 
theta and delta waves through EEG machines connected with electrodes to the brain that through it one could evoke his previous birth and grams. Scientists say that as quantum mechanics explains different level of different powers, same way energy of soul for any person can be explained. Quantum physics so that energy is quantized that it has discrete value that are defined as discrete energy levels that corresponds to all positive integer value of quantum number n, n is equal to 1, to 3, etc. Thus, along the life of a person, the energy of his soul is characterized by several quantum levels of energy. Soul can be now defined as an imaginary body made of imaginary particles, each one of them described by imaginary wave function by similar sim similarity to the real bodies, which are made of real particles described in quantum mechanics by its real wave function. In addition, the soul's energy can be now expressed by well-known Einstein's energy equation extended to imaginary form I is equal to E G S I M is equal to E G S I M C square. If soul is made up of special kind of particles, then gravitational force could act on it. And scientists had shown its graph, which is mentioned in the following pictures. Gravitational mass of soul. Regarding the brain waves, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, and delta, Sanjay Aquino stated that our brain can produce electromagnetic waves having frequencies less than 100 Hz. The brain waves having lowest frequency, called as delta waves, its frequency is only 0.5 to 2 Hz. Its amplitude is very high. Such type of delta waves is produced in the, in the mature human brain. Each and every kind of disease can be cured through spiritual power. Even the patient which is declared as died can also again be alive uh, through spiritual and extrasensory power if the soul of the person didn't leave his body. Cure with delta brain waves. Here the world soul represents such an element which is non-materialistic in its original form. It means it has done the properties like color, smell, taste, touch, and shape. In short, your soul is always dirigent, means colorless, nirakar, means uh, shapeless, and therefore it didn't become the subject of physics. While the world, Jeev, represents a living organisms, possessing physical or divine body, and take birth in universe according to its karma. The soul, that present in the body, called as conscious in modern science, while consciousness is a property of all soul and living beings. The consciousness uses the brain to create emotions, but it cannot create emotions. It acts as a catalyst. American physicist Nick Halbert says that consciousness is a fundamental part of brain and entire universe in the form of elementary particles and various forces which act on it. With the help of three characteristics of quantum mechanics, we can get some information about brain. First, randomness. Second, observables means some characteristics which are obtained when they are observed. Third, internal connection between two objects. These three characteristics of absolutely inertia like matter are due to the three characteristics of our brain, which are as follows. First, free willingness. Second, great ambitions. And third, highest heartily desire to join. At present, all scientists believe that consciousness is in same quantity forever in the universe. And according to Jain scriptures, 
the total number of souls are infinite. It remains same forever in the universe. Same way, total number of Parmanus and quantity of energy remains same forever in, a, in the universe. Only it can be modified from one state to another. For space and time, scientists say that both are eternal. Space and time could be never created. Only our mind can experience the drama of objects played by time on the stage of space. General theory of relativity mentions that really our life is only one line in the space-time continuum. All the phenomena performed in all space-time continuums are same. In the same way, each and every soul is connected with space-time continuum. Thus, scientists show all dimensions in all souls. All living beings possess different uh, types of body in various forms and colors according to the karmas of previous birth. It discussed very minutely in detail and as a rule of nature. Soul is directly react to auspicious or inauspicious micro units called karman vargana according to the adhyavasai of soul. Out of infinite varganas, only the permanent units of karma vargana are able to react with each and every soul which is incorporeal in its original form. Moreover, such type of Parmanu units have tendency to obtain some form after reacting with soul and form Karman body. All impressions are stored in this Karman body and they transmit from one birth to another birth. Consciousness is one type of property of all souls. Even though according to belief of all scientists, it is only the property of living beings having any type of body. And all scientists want to define it as consciousness. Liberated souls cannot take rebirth. Consciousness is the fundamental property of every soul. While a mind or brain which is used as a tool to understand consciousness is totally material. Thoughts are created in this brain. Our soul constantly activates our brain, even in deep sleep. Mind, man, is such an object. Expert Indian philosophy, there is not any clear concept regarding this mind, man. Even there is not any appropriate word in any language except Indian languages. Mind, man, has an excellent and unique concept in Jain philosophy. Mind, man, is an important and significant or typical word of Indian philosophies. Its original concept cannot be derived with any word of English language. Only Jain philosophy has discussed in it detail regarding man. There are two types of mind, physical mind, and psychic mind. Material mind means physical mind is made up of my, more micro permanent units of manavargana, while uh, psychic mind is the cause of physical mind or permanent units of manavargana, which are converted into thoughts, also called psychic mind. Perhaps this psychic mind, man, might be called as consciousness. And this word consciousness is generally used as a synonym of soul in modern science. Each and every soul except liberated soul has this psychic mind. And according to this viewpoint, it is not improper to, for scientists to consider this psychic mind as a consciousness. In short, physical mind, man, and psychic mind is the unique concept of Jain philosophy and it is totally scientific. Quantum soul or quantum consciousness is the specific term for soul in modern science, but concept of world soul cannot be fully defined. Of course, the laws of classical physics stated by Newton and the laws of quantum mechanics are quite <coughs> different, though they are parallel to, to the principles of multiple viewpoints of Jain philosophy. Each 
and every parmanu has color smell taste touch of course quantum physics accept parmanus as physical quantity but is simultaneously also accept as invisible wave vernon nepe edward cross and surendra sip okana gave reference about research was done during 1895 to 1932 at adiyar near chennai which was previously called as madras by dr n vesant and charles lead bitter with extra sensory perceptions and it was called occult chemistry they have also done research about subatomic particles like electrons protons and neutrons etc while in modern physics nils bohr investigated atom after 1925 they also talked about most micro subatomic particles like quarks which are part of proton and neutron which has fractional electric charge proton contains three quarks two up quarks and one down quarks while neutron contains uh, one up quark and two down quarks these are most important subatomic particles almost this research has been done through extra sensory perceptions and therefore it was not accepted by scientists Vernon Nepe, Edward Cross, and Sundar Sip Okana gave importance to this ESP in their research paper on consciousness. Not only they gave importance, but it plays an important role in TDVP, a model of consciousness, which is presently postulated, and they accept it as quantitative model in the form of TRU. even though i didn't critically and thoroughly study this tdvp model and tru model regarding soul or consciousness no doubt it will play an important role as bridging between science and spirituality or esp velocity of parmanu man and living beings is 14 rajju in one samay while the pure soul has the velocity 7 rajju in zero samay if at present science and scientists will accept invisible soul or consciousness which is really reacted with micro particles of matter through quantum mechanics bose einstein statistic and theory of relativity i expect that in very near future they will surely except pure soul which is totally formless means it doesn't possess color smell taste touch and self and that is the end of my presentation thank you all of you thank you very much yeah <clears throat> thank you so, so much um yes. so now i think we will um turn see uh, open up the question and answer session right samneeji yes all right perfect okay. thank you so much there is one question might be what will be the link to access that Okay, hold on one minute. Huh. Yes. Yes, Acharya ji, please um uh, un, uh turn on your video and uh, unmute yourself. Um and then we'll take some questions and answers. I have a question. Why scientist cannot know about the soul, about himself? Okay. Why scientist cannot know about the soul? Okay. All right. Um, so the first question is sort of. 
uh, what so, is a scientific like understanding of the soul? <laughs> Scientists cannot know about the pure soul. Yes. Yes. Because yes. we cannot uh, contact, and it is a purely harmless. It is not connected with uh, material particles named Kalman Vardhana, Kaija Sadi, or Kalman Vardhi. Hence, uh, any scientist cannot be know about the pure soul. Scientists can only know. As souls. Soul. That means living being. Living being is connected with carbon particles, carbon body and tenuous body. It is called as a jeev, not soul. Pure soul, which is at the Alpha liberated soul. And liberated soul cannot be the subject of modern science and modern physics. Um, the next question that we have uh, for um, Acharya Ji is how does the psychic mind govern the physical mind? Psychic mind and physical mind is a unique concept of Jain philosophy. Psychic mind belongs to a Devasai. And psychic mind, all the soul, except the liberated soul, any living being possesses psychic mind. While the physical mind, only Sangni Panchendriya Jiva, living being who has possessed five senses and six sensorium, can have only the physical mind. All soul possess psychic mind. That is in the form of Ajayavasa. Okay. Um, the next question that we have uh, is, is it true uh, that some modern physics um, and the discoveries in modern physics have similar similarities to um, philosophies in Eastern in Eastern traditions, Eastern religious traditions. So, is there an overlap between what scientists are discovering and uh, the philosophy of Jainism? Exactly, I didn't uh, understand your question. Um, do you want to say? Okay, is, is there some point of agreement between Jainism and science? What science is talking about uh, consciousness and what Jainism is talking? Are there some similar, <clears throat> some points of agreement where Jainism and science can share their ideas or their findings? Yes, Jainism and science both have the similarity according to quantum mechanics and classical physics also. Because classical physics says that all the uh, things are in the form of material particles. Whereas quantum physics says that it is all the things uh, in the form of energy level. In this way, the psychic mind and physical mind. Physical mind, according to Newton's law of motion, Newton's law of physics, while the psychic mind acts as a, a law laws of quantum mechanics. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Acharya Ji. Um, the next question is. Um, 
Is there consciousness in all living beings? And if there is consciousness in every living being, why does it appear differently in their levels of, of senses? So of all living beings, is the level of consciousness the same? So is the plant's consciousness the same as the human consciousness? What is the difference? Consciousness belongs to human beings. Consciousness belongs to human beings uh, is the higher level. Why the consciousness of all other living beings is considered as a lower level. So uh, we cannot uh, exactly know or define it. Of course, it can be defined by the law of quantum mechanics. But today, we are seriously uh, aware of our, con our consciousness, not all living beings. Hence, we consider only the human consciousness uh, and apply the laws of quantum mechanics to the human consciousness. Thank you so much, Acharyaji. Um, we'll take probably one or two more questions. Um, it, are there any questions from the panelists before we move on to the attendees? Yes. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, yes I have a question. Uh, how can we understand the consciousness of liberated souls? because they don't have mind, neither they have physical mind nor psychic mind. How do we understand the consciousness of liberated souls? We cannot uh, physically define it. We cannot uh, physically define it, the consciousness of uh, liberated souls because it will not be a subject of our modern science. We could only, it is inexplicable. We cannot explain it. Okay. Um, okay, thank you, HRAG. What is uh, the status of consciousness for hellish beings? Hell's beings. Uh, I guess uh, beings that are in hell. Divine beings, hell beings, and uh, uh, animals, and also human, all have consciousness with the different levels. Okay. Hell beings and divine beings also have consciousness uh, because. Uh, it was maybe in higher level because they have avidna. All right, wonderful. Th thank you, Acharya Ji. Um, Is that what? Yes, yeah, so there's a. Are, are there any other questions from the panelists before I start going with? Is um, why scientist yeah. cannot believe in himself. Uh, say again. Why scientist cannot believe in himself? Okay. Because all, right. all scientists also soul, they have also consciousness, but they cannot believe in himself. Why? What is that reason? Thank you, Acharya Ji. Um, Acharya Maharaj, yeah. Do you want to go? Yeah. Nandi Ghosh Vijay Ji, would you like to answer to, to Acharya Kanak Nandi Ji? All the scientists on the moral level, they accept the existence of soul in self. But on the scientific level, as they have no any clue for this consciousness, and hence they deny it. 
Okay. 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 Thank you so much, Acharyaji. We appreciate yes. it. Um, yeah. So now we will move on. We will continue the uh, panel uh, of soul and consciousness in Jain philosophy. And our next speaker will be uh, Kanti Mardia and uh, Samaniji Chaitanya will um, explain, uh, will introduce him as well. Thank you so much. Can Acharya I share for joining. the screen at some point? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, well, just give us one minute. Um, so I'll, as soon as uh, Chaitanya Ji, uh, uh, Samaniji uh, introduces you, then we will uh, share your screen. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, our next panelist, uh, our invited speaker is Professor Kanti Maria. Professor Kanti Maria is a senior research professor of statistics at Leeds University and Oxford University and uh, an uh, emeritus uh, Leverhulme uh, fellow. He is a president of the Yorkshire Jane Farish uh, Foundation and a chairman of the Jane Nobel Truth Association. In 2014, he released an album. Uh, the title of the album is Atma Ajar Amarhe, and it is based on especially his uh, Jane theory of four Nobel truths, which he is going to be dis and going to discuss in this particular talk. In uh, collaboration with the late Dr. Ravindra Jain, he was a keynote speaker at the House of Women uh, in 2017, and he's on 2017 and he's a day. So I welcome Professor da Kanti Maria being busy in so many big projects. He accepted my uh, invitation and came, uh, have come for this particular talk. So I welcome you and please start your discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mardia. Now you should be able to share your screen. Just, I think I've got too many lights on. So, slideshow from beginning. Okay, folks, can you see me? Can you see the yes. slides? Yes, we can see everything. Yes, sir. Please, please okay. proceed. Well, first of all, many thanks, Dr. Samniji Chaitanya Pragyaji for inviting me. I'm deeply grateful. I think, uh, being academic, to be in the midst of big gurus, I think it's a bit daunting task. But anyway, I will give my version of what I've been doing. Uh, one aspect which started long time ago, maybe about 50 years ago, uh, search for a qualitative model, Jane model of consciousness. Consciousness, I'm taking it in very broad sense, which I will explain later on. Uh, the one thing which I should affirm, which I always do, that Jainism is not an ism. Jainism, as we have been pointed out, is the science of Jainness. So it is a much broader than what normally Jainism is taken as. Uh, so to start in the reverse order, uh, I start with Michami Dukaram. Why? Because you will see that I have translated various terms uh, which are in our Jain philosophy. Uh, so there is an extrapolation, there is an interpolation, and there is an approximation. So those three things, which I'm sure you will note in all the speaker uh, are common. So there is a caution here that all approximate, sometimes these are of the first order mathematically, quote unquote, uh, or other times they are of second order. So it is a search for the right terminology, which is what young generation is looking for. So that's how my work started. So I will give you some background of my model. Uh, there are two models I will be giving. Uh, one, what I call my models, which started with axiomatic system, 
but then later on, Revere thought that it is more like Four Noble Truths. Uh, so I think it take with pinch of salt a little bit. Uh, now, how all started, we migrated uh, in UK in 1964, uh, under which my children were growing, and they had plenty of Christianity in school at that time. So they were very eager to learn about Jainism. So I am looking at the prospect perspective of young mind of the next generation. So when I realized with my children, because I believed very strongly uh, in philosophy, uh, that the heart of Jainism at that time, at least, uh, masked with over century, it is masked. So I started doing research. If I can see the wood for the trees, so I went to discuss, so many top gurus, many scholars, and this led to what I call axiomatic system to Jainism. Axiomatic means just like Euclidean geometry or Newton law, that if you believe in one, you believe in other and various things can follow. So I launched first um, my draft of this axiomatic system in Leicester at interfaith meeting. And then final formulation came in my book, The Scientific Foundation of Jainism. Uh, later on, because of the reviewer pressing, uh, came to be known as Four Noble Truths of Jainism, uh, I think which is, uh, you will note that there is no one set of model. There are many sets of different model to describe the Jain, so, so please uh, forgive me. So to make it my book, the first 1990, uh, and I came to know Guruji, Acharya, Nandi Goswajayji uh, because of uh, I wrote the book and then later on I saw in Ahmedabad and then we have always been a very close interaction. So to make it more excessive, uh, access to make it uh, in a good accessibility um, that I wrote a book on request of Aidan Rankin joint living Jainism so the, my previous book has a lot of graphics in a lot of uh, tables and all taken from our scripture, uh, but it is not as much accessible. Uh, so this is the one book which is, have got no tables, but straight into the like art. Then I, as uh, Samniji kindly mentioned, I launch album to make it more common, more popular, Atma Ajar Amar Hai with the late Dr. Ravindra Jain, and which try to summarize in lyrics uh, the contents of these so called Four Noble Truths of uh, Jainism. So, so, so now, what? Uh, so these are the ones who influenced me considerably uh, Jambu Vijayji, whom I saw. Uh, many times, Gurudev Chitra Banuji, and then Professor P.S. Jaini, a uh, lot of interaction and uh, checking that I was on the right track. So one of the review which uh, made me uh, think of uh, noble truth is from Dr. Shamil Chandariyaji, MA Cambridge, PhD, LSE in Jain Spirit, he wrote, and he only, I will go through this last sentence, this is very powerful and is reminiscent of the Four Noble Truths of Buddha, the axiomatic encapsulations, encapsulation of his philosophy. So, so that's, uh, and this other review triggered that to call it axiomatic system uh, will not go down well. So, so that's how the term came uh, of Four Noble Truths and that how now it has been uh, popularized. Now, what are these for so-called four noble truths? So now think of a young boy or a teenager uh, who is brought up in Jain family, and then he wants to know, uh, you know, the, what are the, what is the first step? And if you are not a Jain, how would you describe it? So the truth one or axiom one, take it more as axiom one, the soul exists in contamination 
with karmic matter, and it longs to be purified. So there are three key components of what I regard, still I regard as a basis or a start of a kick start of a Jain thinking. That soul exists. Number one, we all believe that existence of soul. We all believe that it is contaminated with karmic matter. We all believe that it longs to be purified. It wants to go to moksha uh, if it can. So, so that was the first step. So I have these three, first three, I will go through slowly. And then of course, uh, you can comment later on because there is a quite a lot of extrapolation and interpolation and approximations as what I've been, these three things which are happening. So I will go through one after another, then through 4A, 4B, 4C, uh, are, uh, gives their application and one and three are theory. So one part is theory and other are applications or applied, theory and applied. So being a mathematician, I wrote a axiom one, two, three. And then because once, if you make these steps axiomatic, then other things will follow. So my book uh, expand on each of, sorry, I think let me go down. Expand on each of these noble truths in individual chapter, but what it tried to do and it may not be the correct way and uh, those who have read it and those who can, I'm sure can find many loopholes. So each chapter then trying to emphasize the key philosophy of Jain because once if you believe in one truth or one axiom, then it combines with our well-known thinking. And eventually, because it is, uh, sorry, I think I keep on pressing. These are followed by chapter on Jain logic because that's very important. So the noble truth can be viewed and evaluated objectively and impartially in the Jain context. So those two things, objectivity, and impartiality. I think that's a one uh, which is what, when I wrote, I thought that was the most important in my new book with uh, Rankin. Uh, the publisher said that you should bring Jain logic first for non Jains and then bring your uh, thinking on noble truths or axioms later on. So that's now let me go through the first one and then you can see what I mean and why I had Michami <laughs> Uh So the soul exists, we have already defined, there are three components to it, or three parts, which most of us, I hope, agree. So it is taken, the seed came from Jivati Karm Sanyukta, uh, and then it has been extrapolated, interpolated in this uh, particular format, because I was thinking more, uh, English speaking or children or the new generation. So it, it became, uh, but that's the seed from the, the base and on which this uh, came from. And then related aspect. So when you once believe this, then you start looking at what composes soul, what existence, then we come to what beyond it uh, to describe it. Of course, Nav Tattva, nine reals, and then gunas, we have already heard quite a lot on consciousness and other uh, major gunas, and then karmic dynamic and density band karma. So this is quite uh, obvious, but this is again for young mind uh, that how soul with karma or karmic matter uh, versus pure soul with no karmic matter. Uh, and just I will give you uh, what has been already talked about, just I think it's jumping. So my book has got quite, it, it, is, it is not a marketing exercise, forgive me. <laughs> it's a, it is just to give an overview of what it contains. Uh, so, so it has got quite a lot of graphics and one of them, because of we are talking of the property that Siddha has got infinite of these, that what was one of the question uh, in the moksha. So the key part are bliss out of numerous property, sukha, energy, virya, knowledge, gyan, perception. So these, and then they get defiled and uh, there are various things 
one can go in detail. So that was a just uh, overview of what I call uh, axiom one. Axiom two uh, is living beings differ due to the varying density and types of karmic matter. Tarak, narak, terena, manusya, deva, iti, nam, sanyuta, prakatya. So that's uh, is the seed and then that's the one which has got that varying density and types of karmic matter, how it influenced uh, each one of us or different living things, how uh, you know, difference come, uh, the vari variability, why there is a vari biological variability. So within this, uh, I expand on types of beings, Pant Parameshti, of course, and then Gatis. So that's where uh, in the detail, gets into, so, so I think this jump. Then axiom three, the karmic bondage leads the soul through the states of existence of cycle. So parima, karma, karmano, bharti, katishu, katai. So there are these then mul prakriti, those who are, who know Jainism for them, of course, they are uh, quite known uh, type of bodies, dravyas. So that within this axiom or within this framework, that they fit in uh, in the framework uh, very strongly and the good bondage. So that's a very quick overview of what's going on. Then we come to the practice. So karmic fusion is due to perverted views, non-restraint, carelessness, passion, and activity. So this is, of course, the familiar mitya, dashana, virti, pramat, kashaya, yoga, bandhetva. So, but this is a step from when you come to practice, then that's one of the axiom they lead slowly, gradually to this particular aspect. So perverted views of mithya, darshan, non restrain overti, carelessness, pramada, four passion, kashayas, and then anger, you, we all know they are four, what these four kashayas are, activities, yoga. So, so that's a, uh, combination of practice part, the fusion, how this karma or karmic matter uh, get into the soul and what are the agents. So these are the agents. I won't go through great detail, but I would just want to expose you uh, of these axioms. Then 4B, perhaps you start thinking what, <laughs> because uh, what set could be a good model. So violence to oneself and other results in the formation of the heaviest new karmic matter, whereas helping others towards moksha with positive non-violence or compassion results into the lightest new karmic matter. So you will see the word heaviest and they are well described in uh, my way. Pranighatam saptam narkam gata ahinsa phala karva phalam sarva kimnatya kamdevsa. So that was the base and this is very uh, extrapolation when you've seen uh, into the form of uh, reflect, reflect the whole thinking behind this. So related aspect of course is violence, ahinsa, well-known, then temporal cycle because how, you know, how they will influence from one cycle to another, not only the rebirth, but in time cycle itself in temporal. So there is a more expansion uh, of these uh, thoughts. The last one, uh, austerity forms the karmic shield against new karmons, as well as setting the decaying process in the old karmic matter. Tapsa Narjaracha. So it has been uh, extrapolated to both part, which is uh, Samvara. And the way I go through what I call purification, uh, part to purification, well-known Gunistan. And uh, because I was dealing with young mind that I created a snack and ladder uh, where the transition takes place and it is playing with a coin. So it is not yet, yet, yet a popular game. It is just uh, uh, showing the different transition uh, as it takes place going up and down according to your purification or coming down. So that's a conclude this. So now another one, which is uh, with great respect, mine is nothing like of uh, Srimad Raichandra Bhai. I think uh, it is a big jnani. And he had 
similar kind of formulation is not as popular uh, in, as a general uh, in academics, at least I, I try to treat myself as academics, I'm not Gyani at all. So, so please treat all this uh, as a working of a scholar. So he had these uh, six, and this in Gujarati, Atma Che, Bala Bala. So, the, so there is existence of soul, soul is eternal, soul is doer, soul bears the consequences, there is liberation, there are means to attend the liberation. So these are his Chev Padno Patra, uh, which is what is uh, uh, embedded uh, in uh, his followers. So now if you try to map one from other, if there is any correlation, and you will see that the soul exists in contamination with karmic matter and long to be purified, that one, two, and five uh, are, have got the similar thought, uh, similar ideas. Uh, I think maybe some of you will disagree, but that's a, uh, one thought. Then when you come to uh, his other three, four, and six, soul is doer, soul bears the consequences, they are means to attain liberation. So 4A is soul is doer, 4B soul bears the consequences because 4B and 4C, they are means to attain liberation. So that's a one-to-one -one possible uh, correspondence, uh, in a, which can be challenged, of course, I'm sure the audience will uh, like to challenge. So only I will read one sentence that because Rajan Bai, of course, is a, was a great Gyani. His work is a general contained in Atma Siddhi as well as within his several correspondences, a lot of letters. There's no need to expand on them individually in his writing because they are self-contained. So un unlike this being an academic, I have to, and for children and for a young mind, I have to explain each one that how different things they slot in. So that's a, so this is a, something, a video was launched in the late Ravindra Jain, and that is very popular on YouTube because that describe uh, the, in lyrics, uh, the, and it highlights the four noble truths. So that's uh, one of the things which is, but it's still going on. Uh, there's no time because there are, uh, so there are two songs on these noble truth, and then there are four songs on Sajjai, on Kashaya, which uh, we are working on a video version still. So it has been, I've been talking to uh, great mind, uh, President Abdul Kalam. I had a very long chat and uh, because he was, um, scientist as well as a spiritualist. And I had a, a great feedback from him and I met him in several times in IIM, Ahmedabad, then uh, to uh, Ana Hajare, then conversation, very interesting with Sir Roger Penrose and this is in House of Common, similar ideas I was giving. So I will just very quickly, I think I may be running time, I'm not yes, sure. Yes, yes, uh, if you could please wrap up Dr. Marty, I appreciate it. Sorry? If you would please wrap up um, so we can, yeah, th there's a lot of questions for you as well. Yeah, so we so want to then start the question and answer session. Quickly, uh, I, so quantum soul versus karmic soul, I had a great conversation and this is very good for audience to think. When I discussed, he said he wanted to know the evidence for such particle karmic, what I call karmons, karmic particle and how this connects with his own concept of quantum soul, and there was a lot of discussion on it. I will just uh, go through. Similarly, uh, what has been already mentioned, Chopra has recently given eight principle of consciousness, and uh, I had a, a chat with him, and uh, he replied, and there is some correspondence. So I will just briefly go through. Then the one of the good thing which is coming on is Balram Singh, he's measuring consciousness. And I had, as I said in my book, uh, quite a lot of graphics and this hierarchy of life, which is takes forward our idea of ekandriya, vendriya, tehendriya, and connect it somehow other intuitively, starting with a base for average man. And then uh, these two can be connected. I won't go through the formula. You think about it. And if there is a discussion, 
I will come back to it. So there is a lot of new terminology I introduced and Carmon now, many people take it for granted. And then uh, Kashai has destructive emotions and various others in the book is full of. So this is the last one, folks, the, my earnest wish. This presentation viewed with the Jain principle of Anekantvad in mind, Michami Dukram with Jainness. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Madhya. We really appreciate you, uh, your presentation. Um, so if you can stop sharing your screen, and then what we'll do is we'll be, uh, open the, the questions. Um, so there are a lot of questions for you. Um, so we would like to start with that. So that's good. And then we'll just do a few and then we'll send you the rest of the questions and you can communicate with participants later um, if that works for you. So it's so unusual, this whole thing is, so thank you. Um, no, it's, it's really, it's an honor to have you guys. So just two things before we begin uh, the questions, I would ask all of the attendees to type their questions in the question and answer session. And the second thing we would like to do is if you are more comfortable asking a question or speaking uh, in another language aside from English, if you can, if Hindi is easier for you, you can ask the question in Hindi or Gujarati. Then I will translate, um, and then the attendee can respond. So um, I know for all the presentations will be in English, but if it helps in terms of being able to generate discussion, we can also use other languages if that's helpful to you. Um, all right. So one of the questions is, uh, okay, why are there no, no more Tirthankars after Lord Mahavira when Jainism claims that the soul is capable of attending, attending and attaining the supreme enlightened state? So why is Lord Mahavira the last Tirthankar? I hope what I'm going to say wouldn't go down well. Uh, if you look at the book uh, you know, by Jacobi, uh, he says, uh, he makes a comment uh, that not to have any Tithankar is one of the black sentence or the one of whether they can be Tithankar uh, more or not is very difficult, but he thought that um, possibly, I, I think I can be corrected, that Badr Bahu perhaps closed the door. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm saying, but this is what I read long time ago uh, in Jacobi's uh, 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 translation. And I quote it in my book actually uh, that, however, whenever I mentioned this to Chitra Bhanu and others, they said, uh, and I'm sure all Gurus know much better that there is always one Tirthankar, not in on the earth, but somewhere in the universe, which you can contact. So, so that's the uh, one which is a um, something, those who can reach that stage of how to contact, if they can do so much of austerity. Uh, <laughs> So, so it, is, it is a one of very good question asked and uh, it is a puzzling for Jane uh, the, that uh, this is um, whether the door is closed uh, or not. Uh, but uh, I think Jacobi wrote it um, and it's worth reading again. Uh, and I give that passage because I was a bit confused uh, and children asked this and uh, try to find the answer and only I could find is that particular passage uh, which uh, the, with comments by Jacobi, Herman Jacobi. Okay. Thank you so Sorry, much. Yeah, one of the, uh, one of I'm the... sure Guruji is and panel can uh, add yes. to what I'm saying because they are all uh, okay. Jani. Okay, uh, Professor Maria has given her uh, answer uh, to some extent. Just I want to say that after Jambu Swami, there was no uh, omniscient. So Jambu Swami was the last. But it doesn't mean that uh, there is no Tirthankar right now. Uh, according to Jainism, there is Mahavideha, not only one, but five Mahavidehas. And in all the five Mahavidehas, there are uh, four minimum four number of Tirthankars. They are available at present. 
So, uh, continue, according to Jain scriptures, in every six month, uh, one or many souls are liberating. So, there is continuous uh, liberation, and also there are so many Tirthankars, they are still available on the earth, but it is beyond our reach. Thank you so much, Samaniki. Um, yes. We are running short of time. So we have a lot of questions for Dr. Mardia, but I, we will send you these uh, questions also um, in the chat and in the email as well. Um, so I just wanted to uh, turn it over to, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mardia. We really enjoyed your presentation. It was very illuminating. Okay, we look forward to reading your book as well. <laughs> thank you for joining us. It's been an honor to have you. Um, the next uh, presentation then will be um, by, Dr. Chakravarti Deva Kumar, and um, I will turn it over to Samniji to um, introduce uh, her. Thank you. Uh, now, our next uh, uh, invited speaker is uh, Dr. Chakravarti Dev Kumar. Chakravarti Dev Kumar is former assistant director uh, general of ICAR New Delhi after 40 years of a distinguished uh, uh, service in scientific research, teach, uh, teaching, and research management. He get retired from there. Among his many accomplishments, his uh, novel, Green Chemical, name quoted Urea, is saving India about rupees 415 billion annually. In addition to reducing milk adulteration and environmental pollution, he has, to his credit, more than 200 research papers, 30 book chapters, 14 patents, and several books. He has been a consultant to GOI, UNA, FAO, and other uh, international organizations. His uh, lectures on Jainism exists, 500 audios, and his bilingual book, Bhagwan Bahubali is uh, archived at janeworld.com. I welcome Professor Dev Kumar uh, Chakravarti uh, for his uh, interesting talk on Mati Gyan and cognitive science. So please, uh, you can start your discussion on the top. Om Namaha. Thank you, respected Professor Samaniji, for a nice introduction. And uh, I also offer my salutation to my spiritual guru, Parampuja Kanakanandi Maharaj, Acharya Kanakanandi Maharaj. I also offer my salutation to Acharya Sri Nandi Gosh Suriji and all the sadhvis and sadhus and sadhvi. And uh, great, I, my greetings to all the great scholars, panelists, scientists and students, and also especially Samik Darshan to my Tamil Swadhyay audio group people who are participating today. They're very keen to listen to me. Uh, can I share the slide, I think? Yes, you should be able to share your screen. Yeah. I hope it's, is it, Dr. Iqbal, is it visible? Yes, uh, are you able to share your screen? I am sharing it, but I don't see it. Okay, on the bottom of the screen, there should be a, a green button that says share screen. Yeah, I did that. Just okay. All right. Yeah, I do it again, yeah, okay. Is it fine? Perfect. Yes, now we can see it. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Please thank you it. so much, Dr. Iqbal. So at the first uh, outset, I must uh, convey my inability that I'm talking about a subject which is Madhikyan and there could be a lot of errors of omission and commission. I seek the pardon of the omniscients and the learned people here. And I am also going to relate with the cognitive science and being a scientist, I like to do it. And cognitive science has emerged as an interdisciplinary study of uh, various knowledge processes, cognitive process like cognitive psychology, uh, linguistics, philosophy, uh, and also knowledge management. About Madhikyan, we will know from the next slide. Can, you can enlarge your presentation going in a slideshow. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, as the aphorism goes, Madhik Sruta Vadimana Pariyakevalani Jnanam, the right knowledge is of five types, starting with Madhik Jnana, which is the sensory knowledge, and all other knowledge like scriptural knowledge, clairvoyance, telepathy, and omniscience. But my talk is limited to Madhik Jnana, which is also known as Abhinibodaka Jnana. Now, I obey. Go my head to the Kavalis, Siddhas, and Arigantha Parameshris. All other souls have got Madhigyana. Madhigyana is integral, what we call intrinsic property of every soul, which is an indirect knowledge. And basically indirect because it is dependent on external source of senses and mind. Now, consciousness itself is the intrinsic property of the Na soul. And it uses as two tools as knowledge and vision, darshana. Darshana is called instinct, what they call an insight. Sight and insight, it uses that. I will not speak on that. Now, looking at the sensory network of living organisms, I said the soul has the senses and mind it has an indirect operations. And looking at the soul senses, it is duality in nature, physical and psychic what you call bhav and dravya. We call it in Sanskrit. And there was a question also because the duality in nature finally permitted to use the modern language. The physical senses are hardware. The psychic sense is a software. They say similarity, I'm using it. Similarly in mind, we have a physical mind and psychic mind, bhav mana. So this to the soul is engaging them, utilizing the psychic character of it and employing the the physical senses given by the karma particles. Now, going across, we have sense-based classification. There are six senses, including the mind. And in the world, in the universe, we have organisms equipped with from one sense to five senses, including mind or without mind. Irrational, we call it those with our mind are programmed one, like one sensed organism uses only the the sense of the perception of touch, we know the examples from microbes and plants as an example. Two sensed organisms uses taste in addition, the earthworms is an example. Three sensed adds the smell into its equipment is octopus as an example. Fourth sense is the including the sight that we can take the example of rabbits. And fifth, five, five sensed organisms also had the faculty of sound and there are animals who do it and the rational beings which is having the mind or the human beings as an example. Typical sensory system as we learn from the cognitive science, all the medical sciences, all the other biological sciences as the senses have got two parts, one is the exterior, another is interior and the wire to processor. The processor could be brain, it could be central nervous system, or any other thing that the soul can interact with. Taking the analogy in the Jaina metaphysics, which the scientists have not yet exploited to my best of knowledge, and the soul in conjunction with the senses implies four steps of it. What we call it is avakraha, iha, avai, dharanaha, directed towards the object of interest. Now, the first four steps are, basically it's very logical. When the soul is interested in a particular thing, it directs its sense, particular sense towards the object of interest and to get established in contact and leads to the abhagraha. It takes a second instant in samaya, and this can last for many minutes. Once the information reaches the processor, the soul elicits more interest called the higa, and more information is then collected, and this is called a why. A quantum is collected. This may last up to one more, that is 48 minutes. Then the soul, with the help of the processor and its own capability, faculty, stores the useful message. This is called dharana for future use. Like even the uh, rated uh, aphorism below. 
So first level of communication, naturally, our graha is the just getting connected, wired connected with this one, and the information flows in terms of joules or photons or decibels, whatever is the one that can be deciphered, deciphered or decoded. And the first few signals are called vengeana or euphemism, and then later on the threshold increases. Based on the next step of curiosity, information gathered is refined and filtered, noises are taken out of it. In the second step, it is not simply he ha curiosity, it is very, very logical curiosity, informed curiosity. That's why he ha is more of confirming the authenticity of the information that is coming through. And who ha is applying the logic to see the validity of the sickness based on its past experience. Apoha is to remove even an iota of doubt about the source of information, the content of the information. Magana is to investigate further. Gaveshana is to explore it further. Its utility, Mimamsa is the higher order organisms, takes it to the inner level of it. And the knowledge that comes through is compared with the other available, the knowledge called epistemology. In the third step called Avai, Avai is the accumulation as the accumulated data is curated, curated in the modern language, and that is cleaned before storage. But the curation takes place by using the tools of argumentation like analytics of data utility, reliability, robustness, etc. And the last step is the, the curated data is stored for future use. This is called dharana. Both the Agam, Davala, and Nandi Sutra employ the vocabularies of modern knowledge management systems, namely filing of the data, catalog them, and database storage. Thus, we, another thing that we need to understand when any, any information is elicited, picked up from the source, it can have the different types. What are the types? It could be in types of quantity, from feeble quantity to large quantity, one item to large number of items, speed of acquisition could be as instant or minutes, it can last for long, and the absolute threshold of stimuli, how much it is taken, how much this uh, level of detection, sensitivity of the detection, finally is the resolution, what we call as an instrumentation, resolution of the instrument information that is available, finally the storage, shelf life of the data that is being stored. Thus, if we see from single mode to multi mode, that is single sense to multi sense organisms, then we have for the perceptions of touch, taste, smell, slight, sight, etc. There are five types of flow, knowledge flow, and that could be in the terms of quantity, quality, etc. It can be 12 more. So, 12 into 5, even a single sensed organism collects the data in 60 minimum ways. And similarly, in the case of, that means four senses together collects the data in 240 ways, which is minimal, which can be more. And hearing and mind again collected by 96 ways. That's way in a Madhigyana that we collect data by 336 ways is a grosser classification because between the lower and upper limits, there are innumerable limits available. This is called Surata Nisruta Madhigyana, what we talked so far, which is based on the verbalism or the signal that is coming, that without even signal, we imply, imply based on a past intellectual intellectuality, uh, we do it instantly, we take decision that is called Autpatiki Buddhi, Vainiki Buddhi, based on our experience or the sanskar, we show respect, faithful order. Then we also skill, own our skills, particular one is the karmaja. And finally, parinamiki is the one which we use our basic intellectualism of reasoning, inference, and etc. Now, in Davala, they say what would be the maximum range of sensory perception? That it means in an ideal situation, single sensed organism how far it can sense using the touch. They say it can be 400 dhanush. One dhanush means approximately two meters, which means an ideal situation, 
the organism has only one sense that is sense of touch it can even sense by vibrations etc up to 400 dhanush and like this and this increases by doubling up of it five sensed organisms without mind can do it by 6400 dhanush distance it can sense it and similarly i have shown the day table for taste smell sight and hearing and the case of sight it is in yojanas one ojana equals to about eight to nine miles, which means that in ideal situation, or if you idealize your situation, your sense of perception could increase very exponentially. Now I like to relate it with modern cognitive scientific information, and people have started measuring the sensory thresholds, how much one can sense it. For example, we are able to see the stars at night, so which means our eyes could reach up to that point, a candlelight at 48 kilometers could be seen in a dark and clear night. Similarly, we can hear the ticking of a watch six meters away. A one teaspoon of sugar, we can taste it in two gallons of water. A drop of perfume can also be sensed by our own nose in a volume of size of three rooms. That shows that just a lot of measurements are going on in these directions. Now, coming to the modern science, there are a lot of receptors have to be declared. Uh, discovered and the receptors could be categorized to three categories extra receptors which detect stimuli near outer body surface interoceptors which are within our body for example how we feel hunger or thirsty etc it is interoceptors give the signal proprioceptors are the one which detect which alerts us about our the stature, motion, according to the gravity, which is very important. Now, there are various sensory receptors listed in the scientific world. Chemoreceptors are the one which use the presence of chemicals, like smell is a chemoreceptor. Thermoreceptors are the using the change in the temperature. Photoreceptors change in the photo light, the photon strength. And mechanoreceptor, I told you, is talks about the the environment in terms of movement, tension, pressure, etc., automotive. And bioreceptor is a change in blood pressure, or outside pressure. Hygroreceptors are humidity measurements. Nosy receptors are increasing. Nosy receptors are increasing. A lot of importance because of the pain clinics, pain management. So here is a, just an example of sensory receptors. For want of time, I'll not get into all the details, neither I'm equipped to talk about it. I'm a chemist by training. And what I mean is our entire body is wired with a lot of neural cells, sensory receptors and connections and relating to the brain. Now we know, talking about man as an example, there are five senses, vision, hearing, smell, taste and touch. In addition, I told you about the equilibrioception, which means keeping us erect, not falling, that's the one. As we all know, vision is visual system based on light and photo. That is the one from infrared to uh, ultraviolet. I hope Iqbal, I have time. You can just give me, wave your hand. I can stop it at the stage. Thank you. Yeah, two minutes left, sir. Okay, wonderful, that's right. <coughs> yes, yes, excuse me. So the smell and taste, we basically, on chemical substances, we use chemical receptors, olfactory and gustatory system. Touch, I already touched upon it, that is somato necessary one. Now many, I have worked in agriculture for long years being a chemist, that the plant has got a powerful power of touch. It has a morphology and physiology. With that, it is able to sense the chemicals, gravity, light, moisture, infections, temperature, oxygen, carbon dioxide, concentrations, parasite infection, disease, physical disruption, sound and touch. And this subject is falling under plant physiology, ecology, and molecular biology. Coming to the smart insects, butterfly, his sight has got 6,000 lenses, so it can even view and see in ultraviolet light. Now, they have the, you might be seeing how the flies come and see the taste because they have the test signals, so sensors attached with their feet, and they use the suction tube to accordingly. And just for laying eggs, 
they search the plant, scavenge the plant to see which will be useful for his uh, offspring, the larvae accordingly, because using the feet and they, they lay the egg. Finally, we all know the power of touch, touch me not plant, when we touch it, the, the leaves close it and the Venus fly trap, it traps basically the gate is closed when the insect touches that. And way forward, we need to, as a public, we need to enhance our sensory and scriptural knowledge systems by leading a disciplined life by which both the sensory organs and the faculty of perception become sharper and sharper. This trick is positive thought and action are the keys to my mind. For the scientists, validating and internalizing the Jain metaphysical thoughts will help. The duality of sensory systems, sensory thresholds, multiplicity of organ information flow and organization are case in point. I profusely thank the organizers for giving me opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Akbal, for alerting me on this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Deva Kumar. It's an honor to have you, and thank you for the wonderful presentation. The first question that we have for you is, what is the difference between dharana and shruti uh, jnana? Shruti jnana is based on the madhi jnana, actually. Shrutam mati purvam, we have a tattva sutra. So basic, this is not today we are starting. The soul has been eternal, connected, I mean, bonded for long. So the, there is a lot of madhi jnana, Memory is there and available. So that again makes use of our fundamental thoughts, whatever we have, good or bad, and that is what dharana. And based on the light of the knowledge, so that you know, scriptural knowledge, the soul can correct itself, or even the, our seers, the gurus, can also correct it. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, another question that we have is that um, how does the soul um, become contaminated and how does it bear the consequences um, so how does what is the connection between the soul consciousness and the bindings of karma consciousness is the integrity i mean intrinsic part of the soul for every soul including what we call it the lowest organism called nigoda even nigoda soul have the consciousness and the liberated souls of the full consciousness Coming to the question, how it got contaminated is like as a chemist, I know the metallurgy. We do not know how the minerals come through that, how the gold is contaminated with kalimas, other impurities. We call it as time eternal. This has come through. It came through contaminated. It's only through the process of you know, purification as given by the, our scriptures, we can evolve it. The question will not help how it is contaminated, when, I mean, why it is contaminated, so on. The better is how it is contaminated so that how we can purify, to my mind, that is the best way forward. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for the answers and for being concise. I appreciate that. Um, my question, so, my yes, question please, for every scientist, I bless Dev Kumar. Why scientist cannot believe himself? They have uh, Matigan and Sutigan also, but cannot know himself. Why? Uh, uh, namaste Maharaj, Namaste Namaste Bhagwan. Guruji cannot ask a question, but does not mind it. I mean, very, very probing question. Uh, being a scientist, a yeah, scientist is also a soul and he has intellectual capacity as our Samaniti would be presenting it. She is quoting a lot of things from Eisenberg and, and Schrodinger, etc. It is even Pythagoras for that matter. When they start looking in isolation without more rag dvesh, the scientist becomes almost a saint. So I do not buy this argument. Scientists do not perceive the soul within himself, that he is himself. Okay. 
now our time is uh, for the next session just i want to conclude the session uh, in 2 minutes i am very much thankful to all the invited speakers uh, reverend acharya nandigosh vijay ji and professor kanti maradia and professor dev kumar they have given very wonderful presentation there are so many questions regarding uh, your topic and uh, since uh, we have uh, limited time so we couldn't uh, give proper time for uh, answering but uh, you have all the contacts with all the our delegates and you can answer to them but uh, you have done very good, uh, wonderful job and uh, uh, acharya nandigosh vijay ji has explained that uh, there are two types of soul one is plane and other one is uh, uh, embodied souls and that embodied souls can be explained through quantum physics and other uh, physical sciences so that is uh, to some extent we can explain uh, at scientific level what soul is how it works and how it is uh, our consciousness is working through neural um, through brain mind and senses so that can be explained uh, at physical level or with the support of our science but so far as the pure soul is concerned according to acharang uh, it is a uh, uh, what we say inexplicable it is a uh, beyond our uh, mental exercise intellectual exercise it is the mainly the subject of our realization so that is uh, very much needed to know about the purity or uh, what we say plain uh, soul or we can say the pure and perfect divine soul and that is uh, that needs our that requires or demands our spiritual practices in a rigorous way and uh, professor dr kanti maria has talked about two models of consciousness or soul and that is a kind of a comprehensive view or inclusive view he has presented through his two models and they are really very appreciable what he is doing dr dev kumar has explained matigyan in a very scientific manner and he has explained all the states of uh, all the different stages of matigyan so it is really very wonderful and you have explained everything by giving the practical exam examples so that uh, everybody can understand what matigyan is and how it, how it can work and what is the maximum limit power of all our senses to know the realities so these all are wonderful talks i am very much thankful to all the panelists all the invited speakers and look forward the same support in future also thank you very much wonderful thank you so much samani ji we um, are very honored to have such esteemed colleagues to join us from around the world so we are now uh, we've concluded the la the last panel so the last panel was on soul and consciousness in jain philosophy and now we will be moving forward to our uh, first conference address by uh, muni mahendra kumar and in order to introduce uh, muni ji we are going to have professor nathan katz who will introduce um, him and we're very honored to have professor nathan katz because uh, he is also one of the reasons why we are all here today Professor Nathan Katz was actually the founding chair um, of uh, the Bhagwan Mahavir Professorship in Jain Studies here at FIU about a decade ago. Uh, he's a distinguished professor emeritus um, at the School of International and Public Affairs here at Florida International University, um, and is also has been affiliated uh, with the College of Medicine. He has been the director of Jewish Studies. Um, and also founder and director emeritus of the program in the study of spirituality at FIU. He is co-founder and co-editor of the Journal of Indo-Judaic Studies. He has won four Fulbright Awards for his research and teaching in South Asia, where he's lived more than seven years. The Florida Humanities Council has named him as a master teacher and unprecedented 12 times. Having retired from FIU, Professor Katz is, and his wife lead Jewish interest tours uh, to India. He lectures widely, conducts virtual programs and seminars um, in Jewish studies, uh, both sort of in Israel, in the Bahamas, and in the, here in the United States. Um, he recently just gave a talk, very interesting, on the Jews of Cochin and um, Jews in the, in the British colonial period. So it's a great honor and a privilege to have my friend um, and colleague, 
Dr. Nathan Katz uh, to, to, in, to introduce uh, Muniji for the first conference address. Professor Katz. Okay, ah, thank you very much, Professor Akhtar, my good friend. Uh, I was so thrilled, first of all, to be invited to speak at this August conference. But two other things especially thrilled me about that. <clears throat> the first, when I found out that my hero, Deepak Jain, will be introducing me a little bit later. And also because I get to introduce Muni Mahendra Kumarji. Uh, I had the great pleasure to meet the Muni. I think it was in 2010, soon after I assumed the Bhagwan Mahavir chair. And the JERF sent me around India to a number of places, uh, to Rajasthan, to Delhi area, to Indore, to discuss Jain studies in a modern American university. How should we do it? And I had wonderful conversations with uh, Muni Mahendraji. Uh, and more than that, uh, something about him simply struck my heart as well as my mind. Uh, it's the only time I met him, uh, but it's something I've remembered every moment since then and will continue to remember the rest of my life, I am sure. So uh, with that personal mention, uh, the Muni is a senior monk and conveyor of the Bahashrut Parishad, of the Jain Shvetambar uh, Tarapanth order. Uh, very interesting. In English, if we want to say someone is very knowledgeable, we say they are well read. But in Indian, especially classical language, they are Bahushrut. They have heard a lot. So we're going to hear a lot in the next few days. Uh, he's made great uh, contribution, especially to the study of Jain canonical literature. And uh, for this, he has such honors as the Agama Manishi, a person of the scriptures, a Preksha Pradyapaka, uh, a master, a meditation master, a teacher of meditation. Uh, and he has even a broader range of academic interests than I do. And I, I tell you, if you know me, that's saying a lot. But from the natural sciences to history to philosophy, um, psychology, a translator, uh, uh, and, and he has brought out more than 60 books on Jane studies. Uh, and I uh, didn't know, but I'm not at all surprised to know that he is also a master at the ancient science of memory and uh, mathematics. Uh, quite remarkable. And uh, he's been, he's called a human computer because of this uncanny uh, ability of his mind. He is an honorary professor at John, Jane Vishwabharati University in Ladman, a place I've enjoyed visiting. And I'm eager to hear what he has to tell us today. Moniji, if you please, sir, nice to see you again. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, we'll spotlight now, um, Moniji. All right. <laughs> Yes, Muniji, please. Yes, please uh, Muni Mahendra uh, he, he might uh, this is a video. be coming soon. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a video. Yeah. Oh. Presently, he will be okay. in the present He will join sooner. Okay, no. perfect. All right, we'll show the video and then um, we'll start the, the question and answer live. Thank yes. You. First of all, I pay my obeisance to Bhagwan Mahavir, the propounder of Jainism in the present age. I also pay my obeisance to my mentor, Acharya Shri Mahashraman. All the scientists and scholars who have gathered here online to participate in this very valuable international conference on Jain philosophy 
and science. My topic is soul, life, and consciousness in Jain philosophy and science and relevance of the application of this principle in day-to-day -day life in global scenario. The whole world seems to be groping in the dark, trying to find solutions to some of the global problems like violence, hunger, health, education, and last but not the least, the environmental depletion. The reason, as I believe, is that modern science and technology is based on lopsided theories involving only physical order of existence. Or in other words, the materialistic view of life. Whereas what ought to be done is to involve consciousness together with the matter or in other words to involve the spiritualistic way of life together with the materialistic way of life. The Jain philosophy reveals that it is mainly the free will power of consciousness or it is called the soul which is possessed of the inherent potency to overcome the effect of all external forces including one which is called the karmic particles force or karma which are the subtle structures and together with them or through affecting them we can also bring about revolutionary change in our physical body or the gross body. To begin with this topic, we have to understand first the fundamental or the basic principles of Jain metaphysics. Actually, Jain darshan, as it is called, which is slightly different from Jain philosophy. Jain darshan is that gamut of knowledge or intuition which is revealed by some person who has become free from the external bondages of what is called the karmic material particles. Jain darshan means the direct vision or the perception of the truth. The basic principles tell us that there is the principle of jiva. When translated, we may translate both as the soul or the living being, jiva. And exactly opposite ontological existence is a jiva, that is non-soul or in other words, those objects or substances which are devoid of life and hence they are all non-living things or objects. Basically, all of us individually, of course, are jiva, soul. Not only 
the human beings but also all the creatures animals and even those objects which are possessed of consciousness like the plant and other micro organisms now this is the first principle that is jeev or soul the defining characteristic of the soul is it is possessed of what is called as the upayoga uva og lakhano jeevo upayoga which means the activities of consciousness that is called the upayoga in technological term technical term and we can understand it as the knowledge or cognizans perception or intuition so this is the basic characteristic of every living being every jeev every soul in the world according to the according to the ontological principles of jainism the number of such living beings is infinite in mathematical terminology and also it is a constant that is whatever number existed in the past exists in the present and will exist in the future in other words we can correlate it with the principle principle of conservation of mass and energy accepted in modern physics here we have to understand that when we say energy it includes all the spiritual substances which are energetic in themselves spiritual energy is existing in each living being and therefore we can say the principle of conservation of all living beings this is the basic idea of jain metaphysics secondly in jain metaphysics with respect to time it is asserted or believed that the existence of soul and non soul both is eternal no new soul is created or can be created just like no new matter or energy can be created the both are same so we have to understand that eternal world eternal universe with respect to time is another important doctrine of jain metaphysics and the third important doctrine is that from beginningless time no beginning when we draw the graph it will go in infinite past no end infinite past so beginningless time the existence of soul is there but it is contaminated with material particles or matter from beginning less time and will continue in the future for any time unless and until with the special efforts or exercise of the free will power of soul through which the soul can become free from the beginningless bondage of the external material particles and can get free from the clutches of this bondage and that is termed as emancipation or or moksha so concept of moksha is that only some living beings exercise their 
फ्री विल पावर एंड थ्रू प्रॉपर एफर्ट्स दे बिकम फ्री फ्रॉम द क्लच इज ऑफ द एक्सटर्नल बॉन्डेज वाइल द रिमेनिंग वन हु कैन नॉट डू सो विल ऑलवेज रिमेन इन द वर्ल्ड ऑफ ट्रांसमाइग्रेशन इन दिस यूनिवर्स एंड इट विल गो ऑन फॉर एवर एंड फॉर एवर विदाउट एनी एंड नाउ वी कम टू द पॉइंट दैट द मेन प्रॉब्लम्स टूडे विच वी सी इन द होल ग्लोबल सिनारियो दे आर वायलेंस either in personal life or inter or intrapersonal life in familial life in social life in national life and international life all over the world what we want to find out is through the combination or the union or amalgamation of science and jain darshan we can find out certain solutions to such global problems by bringing out a fundamental transmutation of our own consciousness and in this way we can end to we can end the violence etc at least to some extent in all strata or all fields of our life another one is global problem is about health as who has defined of that is called holistic health health does not mean only physical infirmity or absence of disease but it includes a total physical mental emotional and social health that's why the problem of attainment of holistic health in the world is a very major problem and what we want to tell is that through proper management of consciousness and amalgamating science with science and technology with the jain darshan's principles or the spiritual practices we can also bring about a revolution in this holistic health field by ensuring to some limit a minimum limit or optimum limit the holistic health for every person and uh, the third problem is that of economics or in other words that of hunger the all over the world there is a great discrepancy or there is a great abyss between the haves and the have nots this is because of the wrong type of economics or the uh, or the concept of development adopted in modern age that it has given rise to this ditch between these two classes and with the advent of the science technology and other things on one hand there is increase in the so called development and at the same time the ditch or the abyss between these two classes also goes on increasing more and more so this third very valuable problem which is to be addressed we can address this problem fruitfully and successfully through combining the principles of science and technology with jain darshan and cultivating or 
increasing our intrinsic power of consciousness through which we can bring about the fundamental change in our attitude in life as i told because of the materialistic lifestyle or because of the importance given only to materialistic approach materialistic benefit that is called materialistic lifestyle it is in the center of our society of our life total life everything we do in life only we count for the materialistic gain we neglect all other things the so called values the human values the social values etc and so on and so forth we neglect them almost all of all, almost many of us and on account of that the problem of hunger goes on increasing day by day in spite of the development made through science and technology in this world now we come to the third point that is very important how we can do or how we can achieve this for this we have to understand the spiritual technology involved in jain darshan jain darshan as i have told fundamentally fundamentally believes that there is soul which is the main or the principal existence in our self in every living being whether man whether creature animal insect or even plant or other micro organism there is one entity main principal entity which is soul and the fundamental assumption or the fundamental assertion of jainism that every soul whether it is in the form of human being or human life or whether it is in the form of plant life the soul of a human being and the soul of a plant there is no difference at all altogether there is no difference both of them or every soul of every living being is equal in all respects that is to say it has got everyone has got infinite power infinite knowledge infinite intuition and that is what it is a potentiality potentially every living soul is possessed of these things these are the fundamental characteristics of every soul on account of the variance in the karmic bondage which means the particles the karmic particles we can give the or in modern technology we can also carbons as we electron there is proton these are carbons carbons are the minute particles and every action of a soul every action of a soul it attracts the carbons from the atmosphere which is all cosmic space in all cosmic space that is around all of us there are infinite 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 number or carbons they are mainly divided into eight parts these are the four fundamental or destructive karmas and the other four which are non destructive these are four which are called non destructive karma the actual process of attainment of moksha involves mainly firstly the obliteration or annihilation of the mohaniya karma both types the belief distorting and conduct distorting these four karmas once if they are annihilated totally the soul becomes free from the clutches of these four major karmas and it attains the status which is called as the status of a 
केवल ज्ञानी सो इन दिस वे देर इज ए कंप्लीट हिरार्की ऑफ द कर्मास एंड वॉट इज इन्वॉल्व इन आवर एफर्ट्स इज थ्रू प्रोपर मेकेनिज्म थ्रू प्रोपर टेक्नोलॉजी थ्रू प्रोपर स्पिरिचुअल प्रैक्टिस वी हैव टू ग्रेजुअली मेक द पावर ऑफ कर्मा लेस एंड लेस एंड इंक्रीज द पावर ऑफ सोल द पावर ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस मोर एंड मोर एंड अल्टीमेटली देर विल बी ए टाइम वेर द सोल सरपासीज और ओवरकम द कर्माज पावर एंड बिकम्स फ्री फ्रॉम द क्लचिस नाउ इन दिस लॉन्ग प्रोसेस what is relevant in our talk today as far as the global problems as i have stated are concerned is that we have to bring about neurological changes which are possible now we bring in the concept of modern science modern neurology in which it has been stated that in our human brain there are two different brains one is actually human brain the other one is animal brain in the technical terminology the human brain it resides in our cerebellum the portion is called neocortex so this is the seat of our human brain actual human brain where is the animal brain which is also inside our brain is seating the seat of that animal brain is in limbic system or it is called mammalian brain or there is another brain there which is called reptilian brain so that part of human brain which we now can call animal brain it has become dominant in our materialistic lifestyle when we desire for material gains and because of the effect of karma the past karma which we are bound we become greedy we become selfish we become violent and so on and so forth and therefore all the problems we create ourselves in the world only for gaining the materialistic benefit the materialistic way of life we want to make more and more flourish now when we apply the consciousness power the spiritual technology and we do not neglect the matter or the body from its disease in the same way when we practice the spiritual technology what i mean by spiritual technology are those practices those those very very scientific scientifically defined scientifically they can they are provable those things those practices those exercises they may be mental exercise may be physical exercise in in any form it may be meditation it may be yoga it may be fasting it may be auto suggestion and so on and so forth all these things are spiritual exercises spiritual technology which holds the key to bringing about the neurological changes so what i was going to tell you is that we should increase the power of wisdom which resides in our neocortex and we should try to overcome the dictates of mammalian brain or reptilian brain limbic system which exercises its it is power through hypothalamus amygdala and such other places in our frontal lobe so the whole thing comes down to the neurological changes which we have to bring about through and if we become successful successful in that we can reduce the destructive emotions anger cruelty contempt 
हेट्रेड जेलसी सेल्फिशनेस अटर सेल्फिशनेस ग्रीडीनेस ऑल दीज आर नेगेटिव थॉट्स नेगेटिव इमोशंस दे नोट ओनली डिस्टर्ब अवर फेमिलियल सोशल एंड नेशनल इंटरनेशनल लाइफ बट ऑल्सो अवर पर्सनल और अवर स्पिरिचुअल लाइफ मेनली एंड दस इफ यू बिकम सक्सेसफुल इन ओवरकमिंग दीज मेकेनिज्म इयर विच इज गोइंग ऑन ऑटोमेटोनोमिक ऑटोनोमिकली ऑटोनोमस सिस्टम द लिम्बिक सिस्टम ऑल दो अंडर द सर्वाइलेंस ऑफ द न्यू कॉन्टेक्स बट बिकॉज ऑफ दिस डिस्टोर्शन ऑफ पावर now it dictates to the neocortex that neocortex should indulge in violence in negative thoughts in negative action in negative emotions in destructive emotion and thus try to become free from the temporary problem which is created but it results in bringing out many many other problems as we see in the world today so i want to make it clear that if this can be done and it should be also tested it should be proved on scientific scientifically accepted the accepted methods or technology which we we for example say in the laboratory test or in other test neurological test if we can prove that by certain type of what we call is contemplation contemplation qua compassion contemplation qua friendliness contemplation qua non violence contemplation qua continence these are the types of spiritual technology spiritual practices in a very systematic method technology it is to be learned and for learning proper training is required if proper training is given if people learn within themselves how to make this uh, this te- technology this exercise successful bring about the result it is sure and then in laboratory we have to test we have to make a scientific experiments and observation and uh, testing and the results and all the parameters which are involved whatever they are they may be physical ones or other biochemical ones or other things and find out that through the through these kinds of uh, contemplation or such other spiritual technology spiritual practices whether we are uh, we become success in bringing about the fundamental change in our autonomous system in the play of the instincts or the uh, animal instincts ruling or ordering or dictating our neocortex we make it reverse now the neocortex the wisdom there the knowledge there the power of consciousness that they decide and that will not never decide in favor of destructive emotion or the negative emotion against the anger the neocortex will always decide for forgiveness and forbearance against the greediness the neocortex will decide for contentment against the selfishness and the utter greediness the <coughs> neocortex will decide for altruism and consideration for other people like this if we go further we can bring about a revolutionary change in the field of say the materialistic life are now is now sent to the periphery now we in the center we place spiritual spiritualistic life we do not neglect body we do not neglect the materialistic gain or materialistic requirements just we give prominence 
to spiritual one and subsidiarily we also take help of the body of the material things of the things which can become helpful in elevating our spiritual faculties our spiritual power and the training system the training all over the world if we can evolve a system just as now people have evolved a system for training in violence all over the world the military forces everywhere the police forces everywhere in there the people recruited for them they don't know anything about the other side of this thing is training in non violence training in increasing the power of consciousness training in making less the power of karmons training in making understanding that the life is our individual life or everyone life is internally connected with all lives and in this way when we have the concept of equality of all souls equality or sameness or oneness of all soul we have the same feeling for others as we have those for ourselves in which people will think first that how much should i uh, earn and accumulate that will be the first principle or the first idea in a person who is trained in this training in non violence training in spiritual technology then he will first of put first of all put the limit to his desires limit to his consumption limit to his accumulation he will not have limitless desires he will not have limitless consumption or controlless consumption he will not accumulate unlimitedly in this way we can bring about an economic social order all over the world and if such kind of training is first tried in that state of society who are already rich who are in this state of health there are a handful of them and on other side are more than 90% who are on the other side so if us to live happily healthily nobody actually wants to live a unpeaceful life disturbed life when you can convince people that by developing this power of wisdom of neocortex and controlling curbing or restraining the basic destructive emotions in human mind human brain they can make their life on one hand also we don't ask them to give up everything whatever according to their own capacity they will limit it somebody may limit it to 10 million other may limit it to 10 billion doesn't matter after all if there is a limit and the mindset is changed he is not hankering after money he is not hankering after materialistic gains at any cost he is thinking everything in terms of his values and in this way gradually gradually he will then understand the value of self restraint of contentment of cooperation of altruism but this is the way to change globally the whole world and it requires the efforts of all such people who are scholars who are scientists who are the people working in the global institutions like united nations unesco it can be changed make a thorough research scientific research find out exact and valid means to bring out the <coughs> change in consciousness the uh, this kind of change in our neurological system in our neurological or neurobiochemicals in our neurotransmitters and even in our uh, 
বায়ো ইলেকট্রিক্যাল ইলেকট্রিক্যাল ইমিকেনিজম অফ আওয়ার ব্রেইন ইন দিস ওয়ে ইট ইজ পসিবল ইট ইজ নট এন উটোপিয়ান আইডিয়া ওয়ে দিস ইজ দ্য মডার্ন ওয়ে দিট ইজ দ্য মডার্ন ব্রেক থ্রু উইচ উই ক্যান ব্রিং অ্যাবাউট ইফ উই ক্যান প্রপারলি ওয়ার্ক অন দিস অ্যান্ড আলটিমেটলি ইফ উই ক্যান ইভোল সচ ইউনিভার্সাল গ্লোবাল এডুকেশন সিস্টেম দেন উই ক্যান অ্যাপ্লাই ইট টু এভরি ফিল্ড অফ লাইফ ইন ফর্মাল এডুকেশন ফ্রম দ্য ভেরি ফার্স্ট ডে দ্য চাইল্ড এন্টার্স ইন টু দ্য স্কুল উইচ ইজ কোল্ড এজ নার্সিং অর কেজি ফ্রম দ্যাট দ্যাট স্টেট ওনলি রাইট আপ টু দি পোস্ট গ্রাজুয়েশন অ্যান্ড পোস্ট ডক্টরাল স্টেট ইনফর্মাল এডুকেশন ইন ইনফর্মাল এডুকেশন উই মে হ্যাভ সচ স্কুলস অফ ট্রেনিং অ্যান্ড অলসো টুগেদার উইথ দ্যাট উই ক্যান জয়েন টুগেদার উইথ উইজডম ইন দি শোর্ট টার্ম ইন শোর্ট টার্ম কোর্স ইন উইচ দি উইজডম এক্সারসাইজ আর গিভন এট দ্য সেম টাইম হোয়াট এভার কারিয়ার হি ইজ ফলোইং সাম ফিউ ফর্মুলাস ফিউ হিন্স ফ্রি কেরিয়ার মে বি এ ড্রাইভার্স কেরিয়ার মে বি এ ডক্টরস কেরিয়ার মে বি এ টিচার্স কেরিয়ার এন্ড সো এন্ড সো ফোর্ট এভরি কেরিয়ার উই ক্যান লিঙ্ক দি উইজডম ট্রেনিং উইচ উই কোল হাউ টু ক্রিয়েট উইজডম হাউ টু অবেকেন উইজডম ইট ইজ কোল প্রজ্ঞা ইট ইজ কোল বিবেক ইট ইজ দি নিও কন্টেক্স প্লে সো থ্রু দিস ইফ ইন অল স্টেট ইজ দেয়ার মে বি হান্ড্রেড টু হান্ড্রেড সচ স্কুলস schools of business etc etc in which the career development together with wisdom development the training could go on and people can learn to earn more as well as to put resistance or uh, control curb over their own negative thinking negative emotion and in this way, whole lifestyle will change and then there is no question of warfare if in the world people are given training of this type ultimately the all the people involved in take in taking national decisions they are all human beings if they are all trained in six, in this direction ultimately no one will opt for war or terrorism or any such anti humanistic affairs which are going on now so world can be made free from all these things warfare terrorism violence cruelty etc on one hand and on other hand we can establish peace congenial living congenial family family living congenial social living communal harmony religious harmony and so on and so forth it may seem utopian but it is not utopian it is possible a new world and this is what we call as wisdom world acharya sri tulsi who propagated anubrat acharya sri mahapragya who was the founder of preksha meditation the main key exercise in the spiritual consciousness awakening or wisdom awakening and acharya sri mahashravan ji through ahimsa yatra a, wo, a, full, a, a, a journey on foot round about 50000 km in 6 years visiting every place every village and asking people to adopt this type lifestyle and in this way we see the efforts of such selfless people saints and sages of course india has been renowned for this that india is the main center of spiritual wisdom besides all oriental philosophies oriental uh, the cultures they have also prescribed this kind of thing in japan etc and so we can find we can evolve a common element or or the world in all these things and whatever is proved and uh, validated validated on the anvil of science and technology modern 
रिसर्च मेथोडोलॉजी इट शुड बी एडोप्टेड दैट शुड बी गिवन इन ट्रेनिंग एंड दस वी कैन ब्रिंग अबाउट दिस ऑल चेंज आई होप दैट दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस विल नॉट लिमिट इट सेल्फ टू ओनली वॉट वी कॉल एज इंटेलिज इंटेलेक्चुअल और एकेडेमिक जिमिक्स दे आर नॉट हेयर कंसर्न ओनली विद सच थिंग्स दैट वॉट वॉट स्क्रिप्चर से इज वॉट एंड वॉट इज वॉट दैट इज ऑल्सो इम्पोर्टेंट बट मोर इम्पोर्टेंट इज द एप्लीकेशन वॉट आर प्रिंसिपल्स वॉट आवर थियरीज वॉट आर प्रैक्टिस वॉट आर स्पिरिचुअल टेक्नोलॉजी वॉट एवर इज प्रिस्क्राइब हाउ इट कैन अप्लाइड इन डे टू डे लाइफ इन ग्लोबल परस्पेक्टिव एंड मेक इट श्योर दैट इट वर्क्स and people get benefit of all this kind of things this is our heritage our spiritual heritage which we inherit the whole world inherits from the ancestors so they have given us they have worked for it they made this experimentation by going into forest by undertaking long long austerities by undertaking meditation and so on and so forth they have found these kinds of truths and they have given to us jain darshan is one of them it is given in a very scientific way the theory of karma the theory of gross body how the gross body and how the karma body that is micro body they they are correlated and how the consciousness in human body how the brain human brain works and it is connected internally and how our exercises can affect them all these things would my uh, address to this plenary session and i hope that uh, all of us who are here will in the, in in our own way try to make certain that the, at the end of the conferences we should find out a few things a few spiritual uh, practices a few uh things described in jain philosophy in jain darshan in jain sadhana paddhati uh, some spiritual kind of uh, thinking bhavana auto suggestion many many things are uh, apply applicable to the day to day life if some things we can find out and then a proper system a proper organization for propagation for the training for the research for the training on for the global intern connection there should be interconnection globally and in this way we can make a very very changed globe in the next few years and make the whole human kind free from these these are the curses of the modern age on the one hand modern age age is on the on the summit of uh, development going to the uh, moon and mars and etc on one end and on the other hand people living human beings living in the world they live the wretched life this is not compatible with the modern wisdom modern knowledge we have to change the scenario and that can be made by strong determination resolve all of us if you can do and the people like acharya mahashravan there are so many such great teachers not only of jain uh, darshan but of other religions other culture other country all of them like minded giving stress on consciousness giving stress on the power of free will power of consciousness and then we can uh, meet together unite together and evolve certainly a new man and a new world thank you wonderful thank you so much for those very important words and that perspective um and the global sort of understanding um from muni mahendra kumar ji i wanted to turn it over very briefly to professor katz uh who will uh, give his reflection and then we will open it to uh uh, uh muni uh, uh Mahendra Kumar ji uh, for some uh, comments. So I will... Muni Mahendra Kumar, your speech is very nice, scientifically and uh, spiritually. But I have a small question. 
why all scientists cannot know about the soul although scientists also soul they have also brain they have also mind they are also genius but uh, all scientists cannot believe soul why what is the reason no can answer my question a single question Okay, thank you, Acharya Ji. One minute. Uh, let's uh, turn to Professor Katz, and then we can go to to Muniji. Okay. Uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Akhtar. The clarity of that presentation was stunning to me, uh, and I've long believed that no matter how complicated something is, if you understand it, you can explain it in a clear way. Uh, and I think uh, Henry G's talk was exactly that. Uh, Jane uh, doctrines of consciousness are complicated. However, he can focus them in a direction and then make them uh, clear. And the next step, once the ideas are clear, is to make them applicable. And I just want one word about the applicability. When when uh, Mahendra Muni, uh, Muni Mahendra G and I were speaking, it was. Uh, 2010 Ghaziabad, there was a little conference put together with me and the uh, Muniji. Uh, and what we we're saying is, how can the great principles and teachings of Jain Dharma be applied to the problems of the modern world? And uh, I will take this up in my uh, talk in, in a couple of hours. But I think that is that that uh, Muniji and I are on the same point about that. What, so what? So there's a soul that's eternal and free. What does that mean? So what? How does that affect my life and the lives of everyone else? And he told us that if you can uh, trigger this higher sense of self, the, the, the human mind, uh, whatever we call it, uh, that liberates us to do remarkable things in this world. And uh, so we want to train our public school teachers. We want to train our businessmen. We want to train our physicians and attorneys and, and criminal justice people in some of these ideas so that they can bring these ideas to bear on their day-to-day -day conduct of their professions, which affect us all. Thank you. Back to you. Back. Thank you, Professor Katz. Um, so yeah, I want to now open it up to uh, Muni Mahender Kumarji. Uh, if we have many, many questions for you, um, so I'll just start off with a few, and then um, if we're not able, we don't have the time to answer all of them, then we can send you an email, and perhaps you can also respond to people. Um, are there any comments that you wanted to start off with? Uh, Muniji, before we start the questions and answers. Yeah, are you asking me? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Muniji. Yes, we're yeah, asking you. No, whatever I said, all have heard. And the reactions by Nathan Cards and our Acharya, uh, Digambar Acharya Ji, Kan Kanakanandi. Yes. And uh, we have seen that. Uh, the only thing which is required for us to do is proceed in this direction by undertaking thorough research in scientific way. For example, as I have given one uh, uh, example, say contemplation for compassion or contemplation for friendliness. Maitri ki anupreksha, karuna ki anupreksha. Let us try this one exercise in thousand people and a, a completely double blind experiment, controlled group and experimental group and measure the parameters through the biochemical changes and other parameters, diagnostic clinic and etc. etc. and take out the average mean result if the result is on the average more than 60%, we become sure that these exercises 
our real spiritual technology they have the power to change our consciousness they have the power to create mm -hmm. to develop our wisdom which is in our neocortex so in this way we should do everything practically now there is no more time only to give sermons only to give teachings and preachings they are also very good things not bad things but <laughs> let us not waste time only in that let us employ our time use our time in proper thorough solid research sound research which is validated on the anvil of science now one question was why scientists are not all believing in consciousness or soul exactly the thing is because the soul itself in jainism also we say we see we understand that the pure soul is not the subject of our perception our our uh, sensory organs cannot perceive that it is only because of the omniscience that is direct perception of the pure soul that is made by the kevel jnani that we know that such thing exists now when we come to the scientific basis at least we can prove certain things which gives which are seen in the effect that is when the carbon particles when they have interaction with our soul whatever it is science may believe it in whatever way say it is x that x is affected by these material particles carbon particles are material particles just like electron protons or quasars and other particles they are carbon particles they have direct effect on consciousness so in this way if they can come all of them on one platform and find and do research in this direction then we can go further and then science and spirituality it will join hand and save the world from the calamity from the present existing disastrous condition this is the only way otherwise it is not possible to give the training to the uh, people on the global level you have to prove scientifically people will attract because when they will find this is scientific the this particular exercise the benefit is experienced now and here now and here and therefore they will accept it and it will it, then there is no question of any ism any religion any creed any nationality there is only one thing the benefit is there and we should practice it and try out the and find out what benefit we get people will get benefit and then this will spread automatically and after all this spiritual technology the research in this direction will definitely give result as i have said in my speech now any other question you can ask yes i have out also question what is the difference between the mind brain and consciousness what is the difference between the mind brain and consciousness you know soul soul is a is a non physical real existence and consciousness is its attribute actually it is called upayoga upayoga lakshano jeevo upayog means the activity of consciousness that is called upayog that is the characteristic now that consciousness at various level it will work it will work with the gross body of the organic sharir it will work with the human brain brain then it will it, it is called dravyaman like that the consciousness there are so many levels at which the consciousness will work with certain kind of structures which are also the part of our life and in various ways that will give an effect and in this way 
we have to make this kind of reformation amendment at all levels whatever errors we do whatever wrong things we do we have to correct on the level of human brain on the level of mind on the level of consciousness and so on and so forth at every level man yoga vajan yoga kaya yoga activity of the mind activity of the uh, sound and activity of the physical body like this at all levels we have to make the uh, we have to take to the correct path that is the path through which we can evolve our consciousness to higher level i think it is clear okay thank you so much meeting you it's an honor and a pleasure to have you um, at the conference yes you are very nice samani ji chaitanya and uh, clear sabhi i bless okay, you sir. i thank you i welcome you so we are very much thankful to professor munish mahendra kumar ji professor nadan khat for uh, chairing this session wonderful session and munish mahendra kumar ji has covered over, over all the whole theme and all the complications related to the consciousness and he has shown real point and he has discussed the real point where we have to focus on and that is the training in non violence training of spiritual technology which we have to use to evolve the consciousness from lower to higher level so that is uh, we have to understand and these icsjp is meant only for developing such kind of techno spiritual technology to change to make revolutionary change in the world and to establish the peace and harmony in the all over the world so what munish ji has said we have to pay attention to that that is the main motto of this particular icsjp so we are very much thankful uh, we are looking uh, forward uh, for the inauguration uh, yes yes uh, i i no, i i, 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 I want to say something for munish no, sir uh, gopal ji emans munish ji wants to say something yes no no i uh, he is saying whatever he is saying ram gopal ji uh, yeah yes okay. sir i bow to munish sushil kumar ji and he has given the whole world that special technology which i am also propagating we are all scientists of the soul and the issue your speech should be um, uh, you know uh, replayed in the united nation and the whole world this is a wonderful thing you have given so far i am sorry i am very grateful to you and bow to you i am coming to india i'll bow to you there thank you very much <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you yeah. very much. Um, so okay. we'll we'll take a short break, about ten minutes, and we will be back in ten minutes, and then we will begin the salutary uh, addresses uh, to to officially begin the conference. Yes, right. thank you so much, Professor Professor Marshall Kar has uh, arrived and is uh, among the uh, audience. So we welcome him, and we are looking for the inauguration session. Thank you. Shortly. Thank you. Uh Samaniji, uh Muniji, Munishiji and uh Professor Katz. It was an honor to have you and we'll see you in about 10 minutes. The environment the students are facing today is unlike ever before. It's all about team-based work in the 21st century of careers. Being able to do teamwork and compromise on their positions and play the role different sectors the public the private the nonprofit sector with different strategic priorities and being able to combine them all and superpose them into an initiative that truly adds value to all the organizations and the actors involved the way that we communicate has changed uh, more and more we're bringing in professionals who have a skill set that combines with the academic expertise of other faculty members that really make a difference I want to be able to remove the fourth wall between the classroom and the world around us. The different experiences that the faculty and the masters has were fundamental to really understand what I needed and to gain these different points of view to become a, a better professor. One of the most important dimensions and it's really the crowning achievement of the program is the capstones. Capstones for me as somebody who comes to this work in international affairs as a practitioner, I think is one of the best parts of the program. The value of what they did in the classroom is manifest in this particular capstone project. 
It allows them to take everything that they've learned in our program up until that moment and practically apply it. It allowed me to develop and create innovative solutions for the corporation I work with. It was an opportunity to understand how corporations really integrate corporate responsibility into business operations. The students are working directly with the policymaker. Really prepare me with the tools and skills needed to succeed at my former position at Citigroup as a problem manager for Latin America and currently here at Roco Collins as a senior specialist in Gold Trade Compliance. And if they want to pursue studies or careers in international affairs of one sort or another, whether in the government or in the private sector or in the think tank world or in academia, um, that FIU's MAGA program, the Green School's MAGA program, really is a terrific way to, to get started. To the person that is considering the Masters of Global Affairs here at FIU, I recommend it because it is a program that is tailored to the needs of the global market. Um, we will begin with that in a minute. I hope everyone is enjoying the conference. It's going well. If you have any questions that haven't been answered by the panelists, I would suggest you email it uh, to connectICSJP at FIU.edu and our team will make sure that it goes to the panelists and a response is given to you. You can also uh, type the question into the Q&A box uh, either way, we will make sure that the panelists are able to hear your questions and we can begin. All right. So we'll start with the first video by Samani uh, Punya Pragya, um, and that will be a benediction. It will be a Jain prayer. Just one minute, I think we're having some technical issues. Give us one minute. You can start. Okay, uh, Samniti, will you be, is the, um, is uh, Samani, Punya Pragya, it's she's going to be. No, no, it's, it's a, a video. video. Okay, yeah, so we're waiting for the video. Shiva-shuddha-buddham Param-vishwanatham 
क्रोधम न मानम न माया न लोभम चिदानंद रूपम नव वितरागम इदानंद रूपम नव Thank you so much. Uh, that was a very beautiful benediction. And now we will go to the president's address. Um, so I'll do a brief introduction of the president, and then we will uh, show the recorded uh, welcome from the president of Florida International University. So Mark B. Rosenberg is the fifth president of Florida International University, which is a public university. Um, and it is also a Hispanic serving institution. That means that it's a majority a minority institution um, that focuses on uh, science and engineering as well as the humanities. He's the fifth president of FIU and he's a political scientist by training with a specialization in Latin America. Uh, he is the first FIU faculty member to become the president of FIU. And over the time uh, at FIU, he's increased enrollment to almost 58,000 students, improved graduation rates by 23% and hired over 400 uh, faculty members. Um, many of the departments in the university have become um, elite in world ranking uh, under his leadership. He was also the second chancellor of the Board of Governors for you know, all the universities in Florida. Prior to becoming chancellor, uh, Professor Rosenberg uh, was integrally involved in the expansion and development of FIU from a teaching college to a major um, international university that now has a Carnegie One uh, highest uh, research ranking. Dr. Rosenberg's career began at FIU in 1976 as an assistant professor of political science and he founded the FIU Latin American and Caribbean uh, Study Center, LAC, which is now the nation's premier federally for, uh, supported research uh, center for the study of Latin America uh, throughout North America. He earned a BA from Miami University of Ohio in 1971 and graduated with a PhD uh, in Latin American and Caribbean studies in 1976. Um, he has chaired uh, many uh, panels across the United States, uh, including sort of task force, national task force that focus on STEM education. He was the 109th chair of the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and he himself, um, has been the chair of the Business Council for Miami, as well as councils um, internationally of universities across the world that are developing uh, change makers for the next generation of leaders. So we're honored and very happy that Professor Rosenberg has, uh, will, will be welcoming us officially to Florida International University. Um, and we will begin with his, his congratulations for the conference. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Rosenberg, president of FIU, and I want to welcome you to the second international conference on science <laughs> and change philosophy. Today, we have an impressive gathering of eminent scholars from around the world, individuals ready to share their understanding of Jane philosophy 
and to connect us with leading edge scientific research in the study of consciousness. At FIU, we've taken the lead in the academic study of Jainism with the first endowed Bhagwan Mahavir professorship of Jain studies created a decade ago. And through this partnership, we have successfully developed the academic field of Jain studies in this part of the academic world. We've also strengthened our partnership with the Jain community, learning about their history and philosophy and the great intellectual contributions of Jainism to world heritage and human civilization. Looking ahead, we're excited for the development of our next chapter in Jain studies, the FIU Center for Jain Studies. FIU will create an interdisciplinary think tank where we will explore global issues such as popular authoritarianism and climate change and how these relate to applied Jain ethics. The center is just another example of how we at our FIU are committed to providing a world-class, well-rounded academic experience for our students, as well as creating a place for dialogue and critical thinking for our community. So I hope you enjoy this virtual conference and hopefully next year we can meet again here at our FIU for the third annual conference. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Professor, uh, President Rosenberg. Um, we are very happy to have his leadership in welcoming the Jane community to FIU. Uh, our next speaker now will be uh, David Skip. Um, so David Skip is an Associate Director for Advancement at Florida International University's Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, over nearly nine years with the Green School, David has worked closely with the Jane community in South Florida and the United States. Prior to his arrival at FIU, David worked for 20 years in international health in Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Hispanic Literature from Colgate University and completed extensive graduate work towards a doctorate at the University of Miami Center for Advanced International Studies, where he specialized in agricultural policy and the production of basic foods in less developed countries. We're very honored that David was able to work with us um, to get a proclamation from Miami-Dade County declaring a Jane Studies Day and the entire county sort of recognizing the valuable contribution of the Jane community to Miami. And so I will turn it now over to David Skip. Thank you, Dr. Akhtar, and good morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of FIU, um, the Green School, our remarkable Jane Studies program, we thank the mayor of Dade County, the Miami-Dade County Commission, and FIU's own Office of External Relations for making the proclamation possible. First, I'd like to begin with a reading of the original FIU proclamation submitted to the county uh, in anticipation of this great day. Proclamation draft, whereas Miami-Dade County recognizes the economic and cultural contribution of the Jane community to the cultural mosaic of Miami-Dade, whereas Jainism espouses nonviolence, respect toward all people, and the understanding of multiple perspectives to heal the divisions in our society, whereas Florida International University's Jane Studies Program encourages an understanding of Jane history, culture, and religion, as well as encouraging Indian and American international scholarly collaboration, be it resolved that I, Daniela Levine Cava, mayor of Miami-Dade County, acting chairwoman Rebecca Sosa, and the members of the Board of County Commissioners on behalf of Miami-Dade County and this community do hereby proclaim the 19th of March, 2021 as Jane Dharma Day. I call upon the good people of Miami-Dade County to join me in honoring the Jane community whose traditions have helped to promote peace, nonviolence, and mutual respect within and for our diverse community. 
I will now show you the proclamation received recently and prepared by Miami-Dade Mayor uh, Levine Cava and the County Commission. I don't know if uh, you can see this, um, but I will read it. Congratulations. The Miami-Dade County Office of the Mayor and Board of County Commissioners, Florida University, Second International Conference on Science and Jane Philosophy, as commissioner on behalf of the mayor, the board of county commissioners and the residents of Miami-Dade County, I take great pleasure in wishing you the very best as you officially introduce the Jane Studies Program. On this 19th day of the month, of March, 2021 in Miami-Dade County. And it's signed by our local commissioner, Joe Martinez, the chair of the county commission, Pepe Diaz, and our own new mayor, Daniela Levine Cava. I want to close with some profound thanks to the many donors from the Jane community that have made uh, this really remarkable Jane program possible over the years, um, as well as this groundbreaking conference. Uh, thank you all. Thank you so much, David. We really appreciate your hard work in securing that and making sure it happens. And it's wonderful that the county and the mayor recognize the value of the Jane community and particularly the work that we're doing at FIU. Thank you so much, David. We appreciate that. Uh, next, we will um, turn, we will show a short video. Um, and this is a video that we have developed over the last couple of months. Uh, based on interviews and our understanding and sort of the accomplishments that FIU and JERF uh, in the Jane community have established over the past 10 years of Jane studies at FIU. So this is a short video that we've developed that kind of give a, a, a perspective on what we've accomplished together and what we plan on doing forward, taking in um, Muni Shriji's um, comments in terms of how we can think about Jane principles going forward in terms of healing the world. So there's a, a lot to be done. Um, and we're very happy that of what we've accomplished so far. So with that, I we will show the short video that we've produced and then we'll share the links on YouTube and you can share it to everyone. FIO's Jane Studies program is the first endowed Jane Studies academic program in North America. For a decade, the university has worked with the Jain community to contribute to the understanding of this remarkable faith tradition and civilization. To me, when we look into Jainism, we create center for Jain studies. We need to bring to the world what drives success, what drives a peaceful life, what brings happiness. The, the, the Jain community feels very comfortable with the university. They say university is very much part, organic part of the community. Even if you're a Jain or a Muslim or whatever, for the local community, they know that they can reach out to the university, that the university has done. My experience here as a researcher more, uh, and also like as a member of the Jain community has completely changed my view of uh, seeing Jainism. Like earlier, I used to see it more as like a ritualistic religion, but here now I can envisage it as more like scientific. FIU enjoys a close connection to the Jain community, particularly the Jain Education and Research Foundation, JERF. We want to put the FIU in the world map, saying that this is the first uh, professorship started in FIU and it created a significant impact in the local community, in Florida itself, and then uh, globally, worldwide. When non-Jains look at the Jain ideas and come and tell us about it, we learn a little bit more about ourselves. And, and, and that's the idea is that it's not just about sharing, but it's about also us growing with the time, uh, you know, around the values that we, we value so much. It is not about the religion. It's not about conversion. I think what we want is just an opportunity to present our um, age old pearls and wisdoms of Jainism. Yeah, and I, I really feel that FIU Gen Studies is the right term. 
is the right partner is the right step for us FIU has created new courses that can be taught anywhere in Florida including the first introduction to Jainism The university offers certifications and concentrations in Jainism for undergrad, graduate and beginning this year a dual religious studies global and sociocultural studies doctorate. Even if you don't become a practicing religious person, you should at least understand the values which is non-violence, tolerance for other and non-attachment to all the material things, right? the vegetarian lifestyle. I was just being taught that okay you should do this, you should do that. but i never knew like what was the reason behind it like why we should do it so i think imparting knowledge and values about the tradition in the right way and also like through a through an academic perspective that's the best that we can do to promote our religion so i want to serve as a professor and contribute to the society once i found out what jainism was i was like super interested in learning about it because i've been vegetarian since i was like 8 years old and it was a personal decision of mine when i was younger I mean Ahimsa is the number one principle in the religion so I really like respected that and I wanted to learn more Each year the program hosts two major lectures that highlight both cutting edge academic research in the study of Jainism and community activism through the Mahavir Jayanti and Mahavir Nirvan lectures The Mahavi Nirvan lectures they were very helpful because it gave uh, an experience of like communicating was first hand experience again of uh, engaging with jain community as well as the jain scholars from different universities students and professors are encouraged to do research with the jain vishwa bharati institute in india and the international summer school in jain studies each year fiu hosts two jain nuns samanis who teach courses and provide extracurricular opportunities on jainism such as preksha meditation So in my class uh, I find almost uh, 75 to 100 students every year and I find that all are very receptive by learning uh, all these uh, great principles of Indian culture Asian culture and also Jain culture and they are finding that this is the religion which should be taught in every university along with this growth of FIU's programs was the expansion of our model to many other universities in North America and not a uh, two months goes by that I don't read about some other university establishing a postdoc program a professorship an assistantship whatever it is in Jane studies at their university bringing uh, people very knowledgeable about Jane's into their universities a new center for Jane studies at FIU would further introduce jain ethics and virtues to the world by encouraging interdisciplinary research and connecting scholars policy makers and activists worldwide if you ask me what i would like for my next 10 years is how we think of a research driven center and by research i mean we would like to research and see more similarities across different religious beliefs different religious groups and try to share what we stand for and one way to share is through publications so i think our original goal has been fulfilled i mean beyond our wildest dreams it's been done so the next thing as you said is to make this the biggest jain center but why do we make it jain center so that we can bring jainism or jain values to common americans and and communicate to them in a way that they understand wonderful thank you so much i hope that you enjoyed that short video um that gives you a context of fiu jain studies what we've accomplished and where we're headed um so for the next uh person i will be uh, turning it over to munishri mahendra kumar ji uh, who also has a message from his holiness acharya Uh, Mahashraman. So, yes, I read. Yes, please, Moni ji, please. I read the written message of Acharya Mahashraman for this international conference on science and Jain philosophy. 
इलेवंथ मार्च 2021 और हम वन ऑफ द मोस्ट सिग्निफिकेंट डॉक्ट्रीन ऑफ फिलोसफी इज द डॉक्ट्रीन ऑफ सोल आत्मवाद द एडिफाइस ऑफ स्पिरिचुअल प्रैक्टिस इज मेनली बेस्ड ऑन दिस डॉक्ट्रीन इन जैन फिलोसफी द सोल इज एक्सेप्टेड एज ए मेटाफिजिकल एक्सिस्टेंस which continues to exist forever its characteristic attribute is consciousness chaitanya that is to say that there is no soul without chaitanya and there is no chaitanya without soul our life is essentially a union of two different entities namely soul and body both of them intimately and mutually interacting with each other the soul is an internal entity whereas the body is a temporal one the concept of consciousness and soul are fundamentally accepted doctrines of the spiritual world it would be rather a matter of great interest to know as to what science conceives about soul and consciousness i came to know that the second international conference on consciousness in science and jain philosophy is being organized by florida international university fiu and jain education and research foundation jera may this conference offer deep insights and substantial information in the context of consciousness i hope that both these organizing institutes namely fiu and jera would go on making consistent efforts in providing valuable information to the world on the doctrine of soul which is a well known established doctrine in the domain of spiritual philosophy well wishes acharya mahashraman wonderful thank you so much munish shri ji uh, for reading that we really appreciate that and thank you so much for being here and for your vision um, that has helped to guide the conference thank you um next we will show um a short uh, conference introduction by samani ji chaitanya pragya very good morning to one and all present here and thank you for joining us at the four day icsjp 2021 i extend my warm welcome to all the dignitaries delegates renowned scientists learned scholars researchers students and the community people who are joining from various countries of the globe i am delighted to announce the second international conference on science and jain philosophy which is being started from today in the very beginning of the conference i express my deep sense of gratitude to the honorable mayor of the city of miami for announcing the very first day of the conference as ahimsa day the whole credit goes to the honorable president of fiu professor mark b rosenberg and the all administrative and academic staff of fiu for making this great achievement in the honor of jain community in my welcome address i would like to say a few words about the conference how useful it is for you and what does the future hold for all of us in the context of the theme of the conference today's conference has more than 1000 participants 
from across the globe, making it a truly an international conference in spirit. This conference is a sequel of a highly successful physical event in 2016, organized at IIT Mumbai in India. It attracted more than 800 delegates with a galaxy of speakers from the various fields of science, philosophy, religion, humanities, and social sciences. The present conference is a continuum of our earlier efforts. ICSJP 2021 has the proud privilege of being hosted by Florida International University under the patronage of Jain Education Research Foundation and Jain Vishwabharati Institute. Many institutions and organizations have come forward to be its partner. For example, Federation of Jain Associations in North America, Jain Vishwabharati Orlando, Jain Vishwabharati New Jersey, Jain Vishwabharati Houston, and Jain Vishwabharati London, Mohini Jain Presidential Chair in Jain Studies, University of California, Davis, Bardhaman Charitable Foundation, California, Jain Center of South Florida, Miami, Spiritual Technology Research Foundation, Mumbai, Jain Academy of Scholars, Ahmedabad, and World Jain Confederation, Mumbai. We have selected a very pertinent theme, consciousness in modern science and Jain philosophy. The question of consciousness has been examined by philosophers and theologians for millennia, particularly in ancient India. Jainism has a unique perspective on consciousness to offer a broader investigation of the phenomena. This international and interdisciplinary conference brings together philosophers, scholars of religious studies and scientists to explore the common ground between Jain philosophy and the scientific studies of consciousness. Understanding consciousness can open new avenues of scientific research and philosophical inquiry beyond the mind. It can also help to create a very happy, healthy, harmonious, prosperous, peaceful, and non-violent non world order. We have experts from across the field who will be sharing their expertise and research with us for the next four days due to the changing time caused by the COVID-19, we encourage our participants to stay safe and maintain social distancing. As a result of which, this conference will be the first of many conferences in the future that will be conducted remotely through the use of advanced technologies such as augmented reality and virtual reality. It is a matter of great pleasure that Ambassador Taranjit Singh Sandhu from India in USA is there to inaugurate the conference. It is also a matter of great pleasure and honor that the religious leaders of all Jain traditions are blessing is this, this conference and providing their benign presence in it. We have received the blessings of His Holiness Acharya Sri Maharshavan for this inauguration session. And that will be read out by his representative, Professor Muni Mahendra Kumar Ji Swami, who is the eminent scholar, scientist, and at the same time, the great visionary of ICSJP. We have a galaxy of speakers, namely Padma Vibhushan Raghunath 
Marshalkar, Professor Sheldrick Rupal, Professor Nepe, and Sri Gulabji Kothari, who will be sharing their outstanding knowledge, experience, and vision to understand consciousness in a proper perspective. The major outcome that we expect from this conference is a national and international framework for amalgamating scientific perspective of consciousness with that of philosophical concepts. We will also be talking about consciousness in other religions and philosophies and how they can be translated into our efforts for a peaceful human society with a spiritual upliftment. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the delegates across the globe, selfless efforts of all members of organizing team, all the administrative people and academicians of FIU and the office bearers of Jane Education Research Foundation. I would conclude my speech by encouraging the delegates to participate with an increasing number in all the activities and discussions through the digital platform for the next four days. I wish everyone a successful, safe, and fruitful conference. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Samaniji. We really appreciate your kind words um, and the thanks to the community. The next person we want to introduce probably needs really no introduction and is a great friend of FIU and a leader uh, in the Jain community. Uh, Professor Deepak Jain is a globally recognized marketing and innovation expert whose insights have inspired a generation of business leaders to pursue success for, with significance. For almost four decades, he has, has a fruitful career as an educator, senior business school administrator, and consultant to corporations and governments. He's been at the helm of top European and American business schools and is currently the president, uh, the European president of China's leading international business school. Professor, Professor Deepak Jain is the founding chairman of the Jain Education and Research Foundation, which has a long partnership with FIU. And we, wel uh, we welcome Professor Jain. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Iqbal. And let me offer my formal welcome to all the participants, all the speakers, and all the people who put their best effort in making this second, what I would call ICS, JP conference. And I feel very fortunate to be a part of it. Let me offer my respect to Professor Mark Rosenberg and at that time, it was Dean Ken Fulton, now the provost of FIU, along with Dean John Stack and Eric Larson, who helped us plant the seed pertaining to Jane studies and research at FIU. In my mind, FIU is a place of or I would call a pilgrimage of intellectual thoughts, a place where we all meet to share views on how we bring global peace and harmony. This conference deals with a very unique aspect on what I call human consciousness. And I thought I will share with you what I consider in my view, I would call it the new diet of human consciousness. And let me tell you what I mean by the word diet of human consciousness. The first letter D to me is what I call digital thinking. Today, we are in an era of digital transformation. 
And this digital transformation has allowed us to connect more than 7 billion people on this planet. And today, there is a sense of connectivity where we can reach out to people in lightning speed. The second part is I, and I stands for innovative mindset. When we think of human consciousness, to me, that is where creativity starts. Innovative mindset means we think creatively or what we can do different or differently in terms of bringing leaders who are driven by the word that has been used since morning today, the word called soul, spirit, and that requires something beyond the current state of knowledge. Then comes the word E, and E is entrepreneurial spirit. One thing that I'm very passionate about today is what I consider to be spiritual entrepreneurship. We are all entrepreneurs. Researchers can be academic entrepreneurs. But when we started the FIU program, and it was started with Samni Charitra Pragyaji, today under the leadership of Samni Chaitanya Pragyaji, my whole vision at that time, along with my colleagues who have helped support, who have provided support for this initiative was how we create a center on spiritual entrepreneurship. And the last part is T that stands for talent. We belong to universities and in universities, we are focused on creating human talent. And as I always say, the role of a teacher is not just to teach, but to create an interest in the topic. Today, we all talk about creating bodies of knowledge, but to me, we need to go beyond knowledge. And I always say, Kathy, next line, that knowledge comes from analysis. Wisdom comes from synthesis. I had the fortune of having a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation with Acharya Mahapragyaji, and he has given me a responsibility to think of creating what he called the wisdom world. To me, wisdom comes from connecting the dots. And we have been talking to FIU that how we would create a center on gene studies to create more research. And the center would be the knowledge, and the, the center would be emphasizing the journey from knowledge to wisdom. So, just to conclude, it was 1893, September 11th, when a Jain scholar called Virchand Raghavji Gandhi came to Chicago and addressed the Parliament of World Religions. 108 years later, on the same day, September 11, 2001, first time in the history of US, a person called Deepak Jain had the chance to welcome, as the Dean of Kellogg School, a batch of 600 MBA students. I thought 108 being a very auspicious number in Jain studies, it's my duty now to bring the Jain values, the Jain principles to the business world in how we can bet, become better leaders, better human beings. I didn't know that as I started my presentation, the world would see a new era, and that was 9-11 when the first tower was hit by or what you called a level of terrorist attack. Anyway, we survived that, but my only point is with all my friends at FIU and the entire World Gene community, what we have done is the beginning. There is a great road ahead of us, and we all should work together to bring the best of Jainism, the Jain studies, and 
make people more aware of human consciousness, human soul, and we all can make this world a better and a safer place to live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Jane. Um, it's an honor to, to have you join us and to hear your vision, and hopefully we'll be very successful in achieving that in the, in the vision of the Acharyas and the Munis that are here today. Um, our next uh, presenter um, will be uh, again by video, and that will be the ambassador, the Indian ambassador to the United States, Ambassador uh, Taranjit Singh Sandhu, who is currently the ambassador of India to the United States. And he has been there since 2017. Prior to his assignment in Washington, DC, he was also the high commissioner of India to Sri Lanka from 2017 to 2020. Um, he was the Consul General of India in Frankfurt from September 2011 to 2013. He's worked in various different capacities as well as working as a Joint Secretary in the United Nations. Um, and he has had a distinguished career spanning over 30 years in the Indian Foreign Service since 1988, where he began his diplomatic career in the former Soviet Union, Russia where he worked as the third secretary and the second secretary in the Indian mission from 1990 to 1992. Following the breakup of the Soviet Union, he was sent to open India's brand new embassy in the Ukraine. He served as head of the political and administrative wings in the Indian embassy in Kiev from 1992 to 1994. Uh, he is uh, from a family of educationalists. He studied at St. Lawrence School, Sanawar, uh, and graduated with a honors in history from St. Stephen's College in Delhi. He pursued a master's degree in international relations from JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, uh, and presented his credentials to President Trump in 2020. So we're honored to have the ambassador uh, greet, uh, allow us to um, connect with the Indian community and the Indian nation uh, through his address. President Mark Rosenberg, Professor Neptune Srimal, religious leader, faculty members, and dear students. I'm happy to speak to you at the second international conference on science and Jain philosophy organized by Florida International University and Jain Education and Research Foundation, Miami. I thank FIU leadership for their gracious invitation. I share with you greetings from 1.3 billion people of India, India world's largest democracy with its rich pluralistic traditions has created a sense of awe and has been a source of inspiration for people all over the world for centuries. It is not just coexistence of various religions that has made India special, it is beyond religions were born in India, religions came from outside, made India their home and they thrived. Above all, religious harmony and tolerance became an important aspect of India's existence as a nation. It has also added to India's rich socio-cultural heritage. It may be difficult to find a parallel to this anywhere in human history. Friends, as you all know, Four major religions of the world originated in India, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. Christianity was introduced to India by one of the apostles of Jesus Christ, St. Thomas, who traveled to Kerala as early as 52nd AD. Please also do not forget that India is also the country with the largest Muslim population outside Muslim majority countries. The Jews in India never ever faced persecution and they trace their origin to their ancestors who arrived in India during the kingdom of Judah. India also has people practicing Parsi and Baha'i faiths. We are proud of our rich heritage. We cherish it and continue to nourish it. If you were to ask me how this happened and why this happened, my answer will be simple. 
This is because India essentially sees this world as one family. Vasudev Kutamakam. We are all part of one family. What others may perceive as differences from outside, be it in form of religion, language, color, socioeconomic status, gender, etc., etc., do not make human beings different. The sense of belonging that we feel for each other is real and significant. The most recent example of this philosophy in practice you will find in our vaccine diplomacy. Under Vaccine Maitri Initiative, India has so far supplied around 60 million vaccine doses to 72 countries all over the world, covering not just our neighborhood, but beyond Asia, Indo-Pacific, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean and Africa. And these numbers are growing every day. Despite our huge domestic requirements, we have always believed in sharing our resources, skills, and expertise with the world. For us, national interest is not just about pursuit of narrow self-interest. It is much broader. We want to take everyone along the region and the world in our journey ahead. Coming to the Jain philosophy, the vows of ahimsa, non-violence, and satya truth are also relevant in today's world. You would remember that father of India, Mahatma Gandhi, firmly believed in the strength of these two as his most powerful weapons. If only we all followed his footsteps and practiced in all earnest truth and non-violence, the world would be so much a better place to live in. It was Lord Mahavira who said, kill not, cause no pain. Non-violence is the greatest religion. As diplomats, we are in constant pursuit of global peace and stability. This can be achieved when violence and terror end. And this can happen only when people find peace within. Peace can be achieved in the world outside only when we all find peace within ourselves and peace with other fellow human beings. Friends, Swami Vivekananda once said, the Buddhists or the Jains do not depend upon God. The whole force of their religion is directed to the great central truth in every religion to evolve a God out of man. When we give food to the hungry, when we sponsor a child's education, when we take steps to empower the vulnerable, when we self-consciously reduce the use of plastic, when we respect and take care of our elders, you can add many more things to this list. I'm sure we not only make the difference, we are the difference. We need to evolve from animals as better human beings. In today's world, we continue to see rapid strides in science and technology. In the higher realms of understanding, science and spiritual coverage rather than diverge. The Jain practices of vegetarianism and having food before sunset, etc., are also now broadly accepted as healthy habits for general well being. Jain philosophy also has a lot to offer for environment sustainability. As Mahavira said, the most important principle of environment is that you are not the only element. The youth of today have every reason to be excited about Jain studies and Jain philosophy. They are not to be treated as subjects of yesteryears, but subjects of the future. I come from a country where as early as 5th century AD, medicine and mathematics were along with religion and philosophy taught in universities. Holistic approach to life and multidisciplinary approach to education need to reinforce each other to make human better and more meaningful and to be able to appreciate the intricate truths of life itself. Friends, 
Before I conclude, I would like to mention that there are five baskets of priority focus areas for India-US relations, healthcare, IT, energy, education, and strategic and defense. Of these, education and knowledge partnership hold great promise. India's national education policy also provides new opportunities for international knowledge tie-ups. In this regard, I'm delighted to see the partnerships between FIU and the institutes and universities in India. I look forward to seeing more campus-to-campus tie-ups. We at the embassy would be happy to offer all assistance. Learn, live, and flourish. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste, Ambassador. Um, the last person that we want to uh, get uh, talk uh, allowed to talk um, for the salutary address before we move over to the keynote address would be Professor Neptune Srimal, who is um, standing in for Professor Pratap Sanchetti. Uh, professor Srimal is the teaching professor of Earth and Environment at Florida International University. Uh, his work focuses on Himalayan geology uh, and is interested in the evolution of mountain belts. Most of his research focuses around the Himalayas and integrate extensive field work with structural, petrological, and isotopic studies to unravel problems related to correlation, rifting, collision, deformation, metamorphism within the mountain belts. He's currently working on two extremities in Himalaya, Ladakh, um, Karakoram region in Northwest Himalayas and the Eastern Himalayans syntaxis in Northeastern Himalaya. He is also one of the main members of JERF um, and is one of the founders of the Jane Studies program here at FIU. Professor Shima. Thank you, Iqbal. Thank you very much. Uh, as he said, uh, my name is Neptune Srimal and I'm a faculty in the Department of Earth and Environment in the Florida International University and have been associated with the Jain Studies Program and founding of the Jain Education Research Foundation from the very beginning. We are really missing uh, Dr. Sancheti today who could not be here, but this whole conference bears a fruit to his tireless hard work for the last six months. So we wish him a speedy recovery and all the best. So His Excellency Sri Sandhu, Professor Mashelkar, President Rosenberg, assembled scholars and delegates, and my dear friends here. On behalf of the Jain Education Research Foundation and the organizing committee of ICSJP and the sponsoring organizations, I thank all the delegates from all over the world who have registered in a large number and are active partners in this event. The Jain Education Research Foundation and the entire team organizing the committee, entire team of the organizing committee expresses a heartfelt thanks to our chief guest, His Excellency, Excellency Sri Taranjit Singh Sandhu, the ambassador of India to USA. Today, we had the opportunity to hear your thoughts and this is definitely encouraging us in our future efforts. With your help, we look forward to strengthening the cultural bond between USA and India. We are honored to have Padma Bhushan, Dr. Raghunath Anand Mashelkar, we know him as Dr. Ramesh Mashelkar, amongst us. Not only he's the recipient of one of the India's highest civilian honor from the President of India, but he also is the recipient of Star of Asia Award from President George Bush Sr. We look forward to imbibing some of his, quote, dangerous optimism, unquote, through his keynote address in the next session. We are grateful to His Holiness Acharya Mahasramanji for blessing us and guiding the discussion related to the soul and consciousness. We also express our regards and reverence to Munishri Mahendra Kumarji who had been gui the guiding force in both ICSJP 2016 and in the present conference. We also remember and thank Samani Charitra Pragya, who was the founder of the Jain Education Research Foundation here in Miami. And we thank uh, Samani G. Chaitanya Pragya, who's been moving spirit behind today's conference. Our thanks to President Mark B. Rosenberg, President of Florida International University, 
for his address to this conference. It is only through the sustained and generous support from him and the Jain Studies program was established and has been able to flourish at FIU. President Rosenberg, along with Provost Ken Farton, uh, were the main supporters of this program and well supported by Dr. Professor Eric Larson, uh, who's the chair of the Department of Religious Studies and assisted by Professor Nathan Katz, who started this program here in Miami, which has now flourished under their care. We also thank uh, the mayor of Miami-Dade County. He's one of the largest cities in the USA, Mayor Daniel Levin Kava, for proclaiming that is the Jain uh, Dharma Day today. This is the first time I think some such proclamation is done in any major cities of US and we are really thankful to her. And it shows how welcoming and accommodative Miami-Dade and South Florida is to different cultures from all over the world. We thank the founding Dean, John F. Stack, who's been a dedicated supporter and a pillar of strength supporting the Jain Studies program at FIU. We are really moved that he opened the conference with his welcoming address, despite not keeping too well personally. And along with us, along with our, it's, it's his enthusiasm that's also propelling us forward and creating visions for a Jain center in the Florida International University. Uh, I also take this opportunity to make a happy announcement. A new Jain chair, Acharya Mahapragya Jain Study Chair, is being established at the Ghent University at Belgium with the generous support of Mr. Surendra Patwari of Belgium and of Dr. Jaswan Modi, who is the director of the Jain Education and Research Foundation. We are looking forward to great work and cooperation from this chair in Belgium. We thank the co-sponsors and knowledge partners uh, of today's conference. And this conference was possible and was helped to a great extent by their generous support. And these are the Federation of Jain Associations of North America, whom we normally we know as JAINA, the Mohini Jain Presidential Chair, University of California, Davis. Mohini Jain is also one of our director and she was instrumental in establishing this Jain chair in the University of Davis. Jain Vishwavarthi Centers of Orlando, New Jersey, Houston and London, the Vardaman Charitable Foundation and the Jain Center of South Florida who have been working in cooperation with JERF and with FIU um, all, throughout all these years. We also thank the knowledge partners for today's conference, which are the Spiritual Technology Research Foundation, the World Jain Confederation, and the Jain Academy of Scholars. Lastly, I thank all the speakers who have attended and who will be attending all these conferences, uh, all the sessions in the coming days. This type of incident, this type of event cannot happen overnight. We have been fortunate to be supported by a team of very active and dedicated team from the Florida International University, as well as the members of Jan Education Research Foundation. Um, the teams are very expert. They know what to do. And even though they are small in number, if you can see from the size of this conference and the way it's been conducted, that they have been true professionals, true dedicated professionals in their field. So I thank them very much, especially Professor Iqbal. So I also want to thank all the contributors to this conference uh, and will be benefiting from the wisdom they'll be imparting in the coming days. And we also thank all the people who have been working behind the scene, whom we are not mentioning today, but you please know that we are thanking you from the depth of our hearts. And that is much more important and much more precious than the mere words that we can utter here. So thank you very much and let's look uh, move forward to the next session and we'll be looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much, Professor Freeman. We really appreciate it. So without further ado, we are very excited and very honored to have um, Padma V. Pushan uh, Malshika here with us. And to introduce him will be Professor Jinendra Navlaka, 
who received his PhD in computer science in 1978. He's a professor of computer science at Florida International University here in Miami. And he was instrumental in creating the first Jane professorship uh, in the Bhagwan Mahavir professor uh, more than a decade ago here in the Department of Religious Studies at FIU. And he's a longtime board member of the Jane uh, Education and Research Foundation. So we will now uh, turn it over to Professor uh, Navlaka, who will um, introduce our keynote speaker for today. Thank you very much, Dr. Akhtar. Jai Jinendra to all participants. Andami. I have been given the easiest task in the conference to introduce the keynote speaker of the day, Dr. Marshalkar. Dr. Marshalkar is, an, is a chemical engineer and he was a former, he is a former director of CSIR, the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. Dr. Marshalkar was the past president of Indian National Science Academy, president of the Institution of Chemical Engineers, as also the president of Global Research Alliance. By the way, all the members of the Indian delegation here probably know about Dr. Marshall Kerr, but I'm pretty sure that the foreign delegates do not necessarily know him. And so I think this introduction is important. In recognition of his pioneering research contribution in polymer science and engineering, Dr. Marshalkar has received many, many international and national accolades. Some of the international accolades in include the Fellow of the World Academy of Sciences, the Fellow of the Royal Society, the Foreign Associate of the National Academy of Science in USA, Foreign Associate of the National Academy of Engineering in USA, a fellow of the US National Academy of Inventors, a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in Cambridge, UK, and many, many more. Nationally, he is recognized and was elected as the fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, fellow of the Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers, and so on. I was really impressed when I read more about Dr. Marshall Kerr's real solid contribution. And when he was at CSIR, he led a group of people and he successfully fought the battle of revocation of the US patent on wound healing properties of turmeric. The revocation claimed that this was India's traditional knowledge and therefore not a novel idea and therefore should not be granted a patent. However, Dr. Marshall Kerr successfully fought that battle and I believe we still have that US patent. There are many, many such stories about him. I can go on and on forever, but you get the idea. Dr. Marshall Kerr is a US, is a unique individual unparalleled in his field and unparalleled, unparalleled in the achievements that he has notched for himself and for India in the world. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Padma Vibhushan, Dr. Mashelkar, who is the recipient of the fourth, third, and second highest civilian awards in India, namely, respectively, Padma Bhushan, sorry, Padma Shri, Padma Bhushan, and Padma Vibhushan. Dr. Mashalkar, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed. His uh, Excellency Ambassador Sri Sanduji, Professor Rosenberg, Dr. Deepak Jain, Jitendra Ji, 
uh, distinguished participants uh, in this uh, unique uh, conference, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a special privilege and an honor uh, to be here amongst you, although virtually. I wish to profusely thank Professor Rosenberg by doing me the honor with his most gracious invitation. And also to my very dear friend, my younger brother Deepak Jain for facilitating my presence in this prestigious uh, uh, event. I wish uh, I was uh, uh, physically uh, there in Florida this morning, but uh, we have to live with this new normal of a virtual meet. So I give my warm greetings to you from Pune, uh, that is from a distance of around 14,000 uh, kilometers. Florida has been, uh, uh, you know, my dream city, so as to say. It has been a melting, melting pot of various cultures, African, European, indigenous, Latino, and Asian. From the architecture to the cuisine, it is clear to see that Florida is the center for pluralism, multiculturalism, tolerance, and mutual respect. In terms of higher education, four Florida universities are among the top 10 largest universities by enrollment in the United States. And in 2020, I understand FIU, the Florida International University, was ranked fourth among these. It's a matter of great pride. Just think about it. From one single building on an abandoned airfield, FIU has grown to be one of the largest universities in the country. People from all 50 American states and 142 countries, including India, China, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, many others call FIU home. So my warmest congratulations to FIU and its people for building not only a center of excellence, but also such an amazing hub for inclusive education. I'm proud to participate in this second international conference on science and Jain philosophy. The theme of consciousness in modern science and Jain philosophy is most relevant in today's world that is just trying to recover from the pandemic. But I feel we have an opportunity to not just recover, but reimagine, reinvent an altogether new world. If we understand the deeper meaning of science, spirituality, consciousness, and Jain philosophy. Let me begin by expressing my own thoughts on science and spirituality. You know, I'm a scientist. All my life, I've spent in exploring the frontiers of science, natural science, experiencing the beauty of science. But I also proudly witnessed the power of science in saving humanity during this unfortunate pandemic that caused global devastation that we have seen. Pandemic is indeed humbling, but an acute reminder that science is our only defense from the predations of nature. Can one connect science, spirituality, and pandemic? As I show later, uh, yes, we can. But let me begin by expressing some, my, some of my own thoughts on this fundamental connect between science and spirituality uh, to which uh, His Excellency uh, uh, Sanduji uh, referred to. Uh, when the famous Time magazine chose the person of the 20th century, it was Albert Einstein, perhaps one of the greatest scientists ever. And he had the following to say, everyone who is seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that a spirit is manifest in the laws of universe, a spirit vastly superior to that of man and one the face of which we with our modest powers must feel humble. But Einstein himself revered Mahatma Gandhi. And he had said about Mahatma Gandhi, generations to come with scarce belief that such a one as this ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. And Mahatma Gandhi himself had said, if both science and spirituality go hand in hand, then one can create heaven on the holy earth. So both Einstein and Mahatma Gandhi believed that science and spirituality must go together. So what is science? What is spirituality? Science, and I'm a scientist, it comprises systematic study, inquiry, knowledge of the world, which is gained through observation and experimentation. Therefore, concepts, theories, and principles given by science are universally acceptable. Through scientific researches and experiments, scientists have gained such a mastery over nature 
that they are able to put satellites in Earth's orbit, send unmanned as well as manned spacecrafts to Moon and Mars, generate nuclear power, and do many more such things that we have seen uh, the vaccine saving the humanity. What is spirituality? Let us look at the meaning of the word spirit first. The Latin spiritus means breath, which is also true for the related Latin word anima, the Greek psyche, and the Sanskrit atman. The common meaning of spirit is that it is the breath of life. Breath of life. Breath nourishes us and keeps us alive. Spiritual experience is an experience of the aliveness of mind and body as a unity. This experience of unity transcends not only the separation of mind and body, but also the separation of the self and the world. Spirituality deals with the nature of soul, a soul that is absolute and ultimate truth. Spirituality to me is an inner journey to discover inner peace and is all about expanding our capability to live, to love and to learn. We have to realize that knowledge of the inner world and spiritual constitution of man will give him more mastery over his own life. Spirituality helps man to discover inner strength and vitality to face his own challenges in life. Many people think that science and spirituality are antagonistic, but that is not true. On the contrary, they are complementary, cooperative, concomitant, collateral, and cooperative. Both provide important pieces to form the jigsaw puzzle called life. The scientists take the outer world as their field of investigation, and the spiritual seekers take their own inner world of experiences as the field of their search for truth. Science seeks to understand what is the world, while spirituality seeks to discover who or what is man. It is evident that this notion of spirituality is very consistent with the notion of embodied mind that is now being developed in cognitive science. Much of it will be discussed, I presume, in uh, this wonderful meeting. I'm sure that all of you here are well acquainted with these lines of uh, thinking. After all, this great conference seeks to connect philosophers, connect scholars of religious studies, connect scientists to explore common ground between Jain philosophy and the scientific study of consciousness. In fact, FIU has a long and vibrant history of engagement with the Jain community in India and abroad, as well as deep appreciation of Jain principles. I was very impressed to learn that for over a decade, FIU's Jain studies program has served as a bridge between the Western world and the Jain techniques. Students learn to apply the principles of Jainism, nonviolence, service, respect for all forms of life to issues that challenge the modern world. And had there been a time when these issues have been more relevant than now, as we battle not just the COVID crisis, but also climate change that batter our communities, our economies. Accelerated digital transformations that challenge our very definition of being human. Worsening income and social inequalities that deepen the charm between the haves and the have not. The distance between the two is increasing. The social, the economical, and the ethical dilemmas of 2021 and beyond are truly complex. I believe dialogues like the one we are having today are the key to solving these tough problems and together. And that is one of the reasons we are all gathered here today. At FIU President uh, Dr. Rosenberg's installation speech, he had said, we are here today because we care. I think that this sentiment could not be more true for today. We are here today because we care for our people, for our planet, and for our future. Ladies and gentlemen, in all humility, I must admit that I'm only a humble student of the complex subject of the connect between religion, science, and spirituality. But I respect Jainism as being both a religion and a way of life with emphasis on ethical way of life and ethical mode of thinking. Jains make up less than 1% of India's population. However, the community has had an outsized impact, not only in India, but on the world. In fact, it was the spiritual guidance of his friend, Srimad Rajachandra, a Jain poet, philosopher, and a scholar, that Mahatma Gandhi developed his deep faith in the power of nonviolence. And as of course we all know, Mahatma's faith changed the very course of world history. Jains also have a distinct attitude to science and knowledge. 
based on my limited understanding, my key takeaway from Jain thought on science is that science is a means to an end and not an end in itself. To me personally, the most inspiring and actionable are the three core tenets of Jainism. What are these? Ahusa or nonviolence is compassion and forgiveness in thoughts, in words, and in deeds towards all living beings. Second, Anikantava or non absolutism refers to dialogue and harmony with others. Third, Aparigraha or non possessiveness is the balancing of needs and desires and detachment from material uh, positions. If we give it some thought, it is easy to realize that many, many global problems that we have today can be solved simply with these three A's alone. It's a simple mantra that can have an exponential impact on the world. So in the uh, next few minutes, I'll take you through, as I understand some of the principles and the impact they could have. Of course, this is from my personal lens, as I said, to my limited understanding. Let me talk about Ahusa first, especially the aspect of compassion towards all living beings. And the story that I'm going to leave, you know, I like to speak from the book of my life, not these books that you see here that I read. And the story that I'll narrate is all about a personal experience, how such a compassion inspired me to take an action that changed the entire issue of intellectual property production systems of traditional knowledge globally. And this was uh, referred to by Jitin Rezaj, but uh, he probably would not know that uh, uh, this uh, little incident that happened actually was responsible for this massive change. So let me take you through this. The year was 1993. I was the director of National Chemical Laboratory. I, along with my wife, mother, and son, were sitting on the terrace of our house in Pune in the evening of a hot summer. Suddenly, a bird came from nowhere and fell in front of us. Its wing was broken. And I remember my mother ran downstairs, downstairs and brought some turmeric powder, made it into a paste, and applied to the bird. She never thought for a moment as to whether the treatment of a wound healing by application of turmeric, which works well with human beings, will work with the bird. Just think about it. I suppose the strong belief and faith in treating the entire human and animal kingdom that is deep rooted in Jainism was deep rooted in the mind of my mother too. Anyhow, the poor bird died within two hours or so. All of us had fallen in love with the bird in the meantime. We all cried and gave the bird a grand burial in our garden with tearful eyes. That incident in 1993 remained aged in my memory forever. Soon after 1995, I moved to Delhi as Director General of Council of Scientific Industrial Research. As you know, it's a chain of 40 laboratories with 20,000 uh, scientists, one of the biggest industrial R&D center. I was lucky to serve it for 11 and a half years. The memories of that evening in Pune came back to me in 1997, when I was reading a newspaper report in Times of India, written by one young man, N. Suresh. And the news that I read, shocked me. It was that the US Patent Office had granted a patent, and uh, I'll tell you the number, US Patent number 54015041, on the wound healing properties of turmeric. I was surprised. A patent is granted only when the conditions of novelty, non-obviousness, and usefulness are fulfilled. Whatever is available in the public domain as prior art cannot fulfill the first two criteria. Like it was known to my mother, my mother's mother, her mother, and so on. So this I read in the morning and in the evening on the same day, I was de uh, delivering the Hussein Zahir Memorial Lecture in National Physical Laboratory. At the end of the lecture, I publicly declared that CSR was going to challenge this wrong pattern. You know, there is an interesting challenge, by the way. I was director general of CSR, one of the senior scientists, but I also secretary to government of India. The first gave me all the freedom in the world. The second took away all that freedom because I could not do it without government permissions. But some or the other, you know, I always think from here, not from here. So I just announced it. And the government, of course, stood uh, uh, behind me. And what happened was, of course, in 14 months, we won that uh, battle. Uh, that patent was uh, disallowed. Uh, looks like a small incident. But, you know, many times these small incidents have a big impact. As luck would have it, I became the chairman of Standing Committee on Information Technology in World Intellectual Property Organization. And uh, the very next year, 
And I appealed to the 176 nations. I said, look, this is traditional knowledge. The knowledge that is generated in Harvard, Caltech, Princeton, MIT, Cambridge, Delhi University, etc., is knowledge. And knowledge generated by my predecessors by in the, the labs of their life is not knowledge. And I appealed to the 176 nations. There was a big dialogue. And finally, there was an international patent classification committee was formed with China, with Japan, with India, with Europe and US. And the entire system was changed to accept traditional knowledge as a knowledge. And that had a huge implication because what happened the Indian government created uh, uh, a 30 million page traditional knowledge digital library where all that knowledge was sort of in capacity and it has become now mandatory uh, for uh, uh, for the uh, patent offices to refer to it before a patent is given so that they can understand whether it is in prior art or not. In fact, there was an agreement uh, between India and the US patent office that was signed uh, before President uh, Obama and uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, our former prime minister, met a few years ago. So what has now happened is that there is no virus, biopiracy now. I mean, there is no issue of giving a wrong uh, patent and the entire system has actually changed and traditional knowledge has been given the right place. But just think about it. Just think about it. The reason it happened, well, it touched my mind when I asked my mother, I said, uh, uh, look, you applied the uh, to that bird. Didn't you think whether it will work or not? She said, no, to me, all living, uh, living beings are the same. That's what Jainism teaches us. And I want to narrate these two incidents uh, from my personal book of life, uh, uh, I thought. I uh, must also say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, for an average person, participation in violence is often an aversive and psychological distressing experience. In fact, interviews with soldiers after World War II uh, revealed that they often didn't fire their guns in battle, even when faced with enemy fire. Most surprisingly, many of them deliberately fire above the heads of the enemies. So why do people engage in violence? We are talking about the first principle, uh, Ahimsa. And why does violence beget even more violence? A study that delves into why ordinary people engage in collective violence, harming others on behalf of their group was laid by Princeton researchers in 2015. I quote from this study, violent groups can promote violent behavior among members by increasing members' motivation to engage in violence, particularly through group identification and deliberate strategies and by removing psychological obstacles to violence, that is by making violence less aversive. Research also suggests that engaging in violent behavior makes people more, not less likely to engage in violence in the future. In contrast, that is where Jainism is great. Jainism teaches us to strive to cause minimal impact on any and every life, no matter how microscopic it is. Jainism promotes peace that is mutually beneficial, cooperative, harmonious, and cultivates a sense of justice among all parts. It involves practicing compassion and empathy, tolerance and acceptance, much, much needed in today's times. Isn't it uh, surprising uh, how one's identity can both cause and stop one from causing violence? In a world that is increasingly divided, politically, ideologically, the Jain principle of do no harm is not just relevant, but is the most wanted most urgent message to my mind. Peace is of course multifaceted, peace within oneself, intrapersonal peace, peace within individuals, interpersonal peace, peace within groups, intergroup peace, and peace, is, uh, peace within countries, societies and cultures, international peace is most important. We can all be inspired to move through the world in a more gentle way. And I'm particularly concerned by the fact that during pandemic, within 100 days, 100 million families move from poverty to extreme poverty. Inequalities were reducing and suddenly within 100 days, years of work has gone astray. And it is called social disharmony. Social disharmony uh, causes uh, loss of peace. And therefore, there are even greater challenges. And therefore, the message of Jainism today is even more important than it was before we find. Let me move on to the second one, the Anekanta one. That principle explains that any argument has many sides and there is not always one right answer. 
It promotes equality, respect for all diverse views, ideologies, and opinions. There is a long advocated transforming arguments into discussions for greater benefit for all. Indeed, science is no exception to it. As a scientist, I can say that. In the last few decades, scientists have truly learned the importance of having free and open knowledge that promotes discussion, that promotes debate, and that promotes academic rigor. The open source science or open science movement states that science must be done in an open and reproducible fashion where all components of research are open. At the core, this includes open access, open data, open source, open standards that offer unfettered dissemination of scientific discourse. Just think about it. Parachute works only when it is open. Mind is also like that. It works only when it is open. It is this openness that the second principle is talking about. So this thing enable reproducible science by giving full access to the major components of scientific uh, research, which no doubt promote anekantavad in science. Anekantavad in science. That, that, isn't that beautiful? There are a number of additional components that are being explored too, such as open peer review, where the reviewers of specific publications post reviews openly. Let me, uh, I'm, I'm, as you can see, I'm looking at Jainism and the science, you know, as a scientist, what I can sort of uh, learn from that. Uh, let me uh, move on uh, to the next one, the, the last one, the Aparigraha, is about non-possessiveness, or dare I say, non-greed. It teaches us to take only what we need, keep only what serves us in the moment, and to let go when the time is right. While this applies to both material and non-material things, let us discuss material goods first, especially in the context of climate change. Uh, Floridians are experiencing increased flooding due to sea level rise. There are concerns about more frequent or more intense hurricanes. Native Floridian flora, fauna, and habitat are being devastated. From the Everglades in South Florida to the Arctic Ocean at the North Pole, FIU researchers are using working day and night to make a real difference. But can we, as individuals, do our bit and practice a parigraha? That is the big question. From buying over 100 kilos of plastic, and a reference was uh, made to that little earlier by His Excellency, to dozens of items of clothing every year, to numbers of consumption are mind boggling. Mahatma Gandhi had said, the world has enough for everyone's needs, but not for everyone's greed. And you know, this is where I had proposed Gandhian engineering. Uh, in, 2000, uh, in 2008, uh, the, and, and uh, uh, that was putting Gandhiji's two tennis together. The benefits of science must reach all, and there is enough for everyone's greed, but uh, the need, but not for everyone's greed. That became, you know, doing more from less for more and more people in the world, MLM. And I remember the Harvard Business Review paper that C.K. Prahlad and I wrote on getting more from less for more uh, as a new uh, paradigm in Gandhian engineering has uh, spread like uh, sort of a wildfire. And this paper has been now ranked among the top 10 must reach uh, uh, papers. But it is all an expression of Aparigraha, to be honest. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm connecting everything with everything as you can uh, quite clearly see, uh, see. It's been so thrilling. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank you uh, talk to you about the role of science and spirituality finally in the current coronavirus pandemic, a pandemic that has caused a devastation through both loss of lives as well as livelihoods, sparing no nation, sparing no society. What does the virus do? At an individual person's level, it causes damage to body, causes damage to mind, causes damage to soul. I'll show as to how science and spirituality together can heal body, can heal mind, as well as heal soul. The healing of body is delivered through science. That you know. You know, it was science that provided diagnostic testing kits to detect the disease in the first place. Drugs and therapeutics to cure the disease in the second place. We have vaccines to prevent the disease in the third place. Then we had masks to protect the ingress of virus into the human body. And this was coupled with social behavioral changes like self-isolation, social distancing, etc. So along with body, the second healing required is that of mind. The virus made the need for positive psychological response that will reduce stress, that will reduce trauma, and the need of the world. Many turn to meditation. 
Meditation is being alone in silence with yourself and letting your awareness go to the place where peace and joy are eternal. Meditation is good for anti-stress. Anti-stress in turn helps create a strong immune response. This in turn helps fight COVID-19 better. In fact, research has shown that there's a significant improvement in immune functions in response to spiritual care practices, by the way. I'm talking about science. It is not a perception. Along with body and mind, there is damage to the soul as millions of people experience a sick soul. Why does that happen? In a time of crisis, like we had in pandemic, or we are having, there is this impulse to go into emergency mode, fear, concern, and panic. Giving to those impulses results in soul sickness. Damage to soul results in weariness of heart, existential dread, sinking feeling that nothing really matters. One can achieve healing of the soul in many ways. Having a sense of meaning, having a sense of purpose, loving, being loved, something that Jainism um, um, promotes and champions. Tapping into inner peace and joy, being service to others, bringing comfort to someone feeling lonely and anxious. Spirituality can play a big role during coronavirus pandemic because it promotes coping strategies for stress, promotes recovery, promotes resilience, prevents burnout. It can be a life enhancing factor and a, a, a coping resource which allows patients to deal with adversity in a better way. It may also increase their hopes for the future. Spiritual care can form a part of the holistic approach to deal with the body, mind, spirit aspect of the population affected by coronavirus pandemic. Finally, the big picture, spiritual values are creative and constructive mechanism working to stabilize the society, working to prevent its destruction. Compassion, kindness, sympathy, and caring care are some of the spiritual values that drive humanity in its basic form. COVID-19 has aroused the spirit of unity and interconnectedness. Despite this diversity, by the way, in the health systems of several countries, leading to global cooperation, like it happened in the case of vaccines, collective decisions, actions at national, state, provincial, and local levels. COVID-19 has removed barriers of us and them here and there, and has stirred the feeling of belonging among all of us. It has demonstrated that it sees our globe as one single interdependent community, like we say in India, Vasudeva, uh, 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 Kutumbakam, we have realized that COVID-19 is not is the problem of all and not some. However, it faces huge contracting forces that push in a non-spiritual direction uh, too. For example, stigmatization, blaming, scapegoating, capitalism by populist uh, politicians, and also sometimes like in geopolitics. Society must avoid such damaging non-spiritual acts at all costs. COVID-19 reminds us we are, deep down, spiritual beings. Whether we realize it or not, and makes us recognize that the problem of coronavirus is a challenge that requires a component of compassion to elevate suffering and a greater responsibility to exercise our faith to witness divine intervention. In a way, COVID-19 is also a battle for our souls. I would say a spiritual battle for the 21st century. It is a battle we have to win. I'm a hardened believer in the human spirit. I was introduced as a dangerous optimist. Yes, I'm a dangerous optimist, an audacious optimist. I'm sure we'll bounce back again while ending my heartful thanks to Professor Rosenberg and my very, very dear brother Deepak Jain, to all of you, the organizers, for deeming it or considering it me worthy of speaking to this erudite gathering uh, today. I accept this honor most humbly. My deepest thanks to all the attendees. I wish you all the best of health, best of happiness, best of tranquility, and most importantly, peace, both in the outer world and equally importantly, in our inner world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Mashilkar Saab, I, I don't know where to begin, but just not to take too much time, it was January of this year. I had the pleasure of sitting next to him. 40 years ago, when we were doing our master's degree, I heard the name Dr. Ramesh, Dr. Mashilkar.
as a scientist. I never knew a day would come when that boy would get a chance to sit next to him. I had the pleasure of bowing my head and he put his blessings and I had the pleasure of getting and touching his feet. So Mashalkar Sahab, you have done my dream. And also by agreeing to bless us with such beautiful combination of three verbs, science, spirituality, and soul. To me, it was a symphony where you brought the three things together to create global peace and harmony. So we all on behalf of FIU, JERF, and this conference attendees offer our sincere thanks and gratitude. And we look forward to many more years of wisdom and your sharing of thoughts so that we can take Jain Studies program to a newer and a greater level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Jain. Um, thank you so much, Padma uh, V. Pusan Bhashekar. Thank you for the really wonderful and inspiring talk and to know and understand the great contributions that you've made to securing the, the heritage of India. Um, I, I think uh, Professor Nav Lakhan would like to say a few words um, before we move to the, to the next section. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Akhtar. Wow, what a thought-provoking lecture. Dr. Mashalkar, your words will guide our future. I am positive that you have charted a very good course for us to follow in the future. Everybody knows about this conference, so I won't go into the details, but my last word would be, hopefully you will find yourself more conscious, more chetan after the conference is finished. I urge you to remember and think of the international conference organizers, Florida International University and Jain Education and Research Foundation and in particular, Shamni Chari, Ch Chaitanya Pragyaji, also Charitra Pragyaji, for giving us this opportunity to learn and adopt consciousness in our futures. Thank you all for attending. And hopefully, you will feel better after the conference, I hope. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Padmavi, uh, Pushan, Malshekar. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for coming. Um, and so we will take a five minute break uh, before we move on to the next section. Thank you guys so Thank much. And we'll see you in about five minutes. How are you doing? Like an I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. 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 I'm Live on Facebook. All right, perfect, great. We can go ahead now. Perfect. All right. So, um, without further ado, um, I want to welcome everyone back uh, for the next uh, section, which is going to be uh, uh, addressed by Professor Nathan Katz. And to introduce Professor Katz, we'll uh, return to Professor Deepak Jain, who will introduce uh, Professor Katz. So. Professor Deepak Jain, please. 
good morning good afternoon good evening or good day to all the attendees and i feel very emotional about this particular occasion and i will tell you why very few people in life lives to get an opportunity to make sure that this to start something to build something and under the leadership of samri ji charitra pragya ji this idea was brought that how we create a professorship on jain studies to bring the deep knowledge embedded in jain scriptures to the modern world lots of people one a distinguished alum of fiu sapan bafna at that time shashi jain was there of course neptune sahab nafla fag ji and many others had this idea that can we do something at fiu and we thought let's try to find out what it takes to bring a professorship in the department of philosophy and religion and we heard about a certain amount let me tell you with the generous support of lots of donors i have never seen such a speedy execution of something that we wanted to do and fiu gave us a home but the home was the hardware the software was given to us by a person whom we are going to hear today and that person happens to be an emeritus distinguished professor called nathan katz bhagwan mahavir brought a concept to the world that i think is the real contribution of jain studies to the world and that is the concept of anekant or multiple multiplicity of viewpoints today we have with us a person who is a true manifestation of what i call anekant professor katz is the founder of the program in the study of spirituality director of jewish studies kaufman professor in the college of business administration and affiliated faculty in the college of medicine how much diversity of intellectual experience you can have in one person and all i used to hear buy one get one free but here i see buy one get multiple things free in one person so we all are blessed to have with us a person who is not only a scholar but helped us start this program on jain studies at fiu his commitment his cooperation to samri chetanya pragya ji we just heard from her and i remember he also gave me an opportunity to meet his holiness dalai lama and i remember that day when the first check to fiu was in the hand of his holiness dalai lama and i never thought as a growing up in a small town in india that one day i would get a chance to be at the same forum with dalai lama and that is was only possible because of nathan katz so professor katz you may have done many things in life but you have touched me personally and not only me i tell you this is the cord you created and today it has become a widespread concept of how we bring jain studies and research to the world fiu was the beginning i don't know the exact number now today we have 12 13 such professorships 
And Mr. Jaswant Modi has this vision, which I think one day we all will work together. He wants to have 24 such professorships in the name of 24 Tirthankaras all over the world. And I tell you, you started this chord. You are the, what I would call the symphony conductor. <laughs> we are all the nodes. We just want to make sure that the nodes are connected and we don't create noise. You are the music behind <laughs> it. You are the music to the ears. And please, all of us are very grateful to you. And we are here to listen to what you are going to say about applying Jane values to contemporary America. I would say not to America, but to contemporary world. The floor is yours. Thank you. Ah, dear Deepakji, thank you. Uh, really, uh, in my career, uh, this was one of the highlights, no question, of uh, being able to work with you all to getting to know many of you. Uh, 